white homeboy in shades and a wife-beater shirt hung out the passenger window of the pickup, started screaming at her. Bitch, I should cap your ass for what you just did. There's two kids in this car. You could have killed us all. Justine suddenly couldn't do anything but nod and start to cry. I'm sorry, she sobbed back at him. I'm having a bad, bad day. The rage in the homeboy's face lessened. Hey, lady, pull over or something. Get a grip. You're going to kill someone if you don't watch it. Justine did just that, wiping away tears, pulling off the street into a strip mall parking lot. She parked away from the cars near Starbucks, away from anyone else. Leaning her head on the steering wheel, she began to cry again, and let herself do it freely. The attack in the jailhouse had upended her in ways she just couldn't explain, couldn't control. I've got to see someone, she decided, speaking out loud. I've got to treat this like what it is, the... Her cell phone rang. She hesitated at first to look at the caller ID, fearing Paul or even Jack. But then she did, and saw a number she did not recognize. She cleared her throat, answered, Hello, is me Smith? Came a heavily accented woman's voice that sounded vaguely familiar. Yes, this is Justine Smith. Who is this? The woman's voice dropped to a whisper. Is Anita, Anita Fontana. I work for... I know who you are, Miss Fontana. I remember. What's wrong? A moment's hesitation before the Harlow's housekeeper said with increasing urgency. We see them on the news, but we hear nothing except the children are okay. Mr. Sanders and Miss Bronson won't tell us what has happened, where the children are. They won't let us see them. They won't let us see Miguel or... She wept. Please help us. Whatever fugue state had gripped Justine now left her as quickly as fog on a wind. She heard the housekeeper's anguish, and from that found direction. Strength. The people at Harlow Quinn were way too controlling, she decided, way too Machiavellian, and it was about time she got to the bottom of why. Tell me where they're keeping you, she said. I'll come there, tell you everything I know. Chapter 74 About 8.30 that morning, after showering, shaving, and changing in the washroom off my office, I entered the lab and found Mobot already at her workstation. She was gulping coffee, munching on a crispy cream donut. Those'll give you a heart attack, Maureen, I said. Her brow rose archly. You are parenting me now, Jack? Okay, we're not going there, I replied, hands up in instant surrender. No, we're not. And let me be the first to tell you, I still don't have squat on ESH Limited. It's a shell company, of course, registered in the Caymans, but all I'm coming up with is a filing agent in Georgetown, and he's not answering his phone or returning my calls. I thought about Christine Townsend's promise to look into the company. How long would that take? We have anyone on retainer in the Caribbean? I'd be glad to pop over to Grand Cayman in the jet. You're too valuable here, I said. She pouted. What can I say? It's the downside of being super competent. Mobot bit viciously into the last of her Krispy Kreme, gave her computer an order, scanned the screen, swallowed, said, Carlos San Cielo, Puerto Rico. I remember him. Good guy, I said. Contact him. Have him fly in there. Pay Mr. Registered Agent a visit in person. Tell him he represents someone with deep pockets who wishes to form, say, a dozen companies there, but in return, we need a little bit of information about ESH Limited. She looked at me as if she'd caught me with my hand in the Krispy Kreme bag. But you have no intention of forming companies in the Caymans. Your point? I asked. Before Maureen could reply, Sai entered the lab, displayed a white iPhone in a plastic evidence sleeve, said, It's Malia Harlow's. Last night it occurred to me that it was the only device with a memory left inside the Harlow house except those doctored security tapes. Okay, I said. I got it going at home and had a look, Kloppenberg said, rolling his eyes at Mobot. Some of the texts regarding Justin Bieber were a bit over the top. Texts regarding Justin can never be over the top, Mobot shot back. She had a picture of the teen crooner taped to the side of her computer 
along with a dozen other pop celebrities. I frowned, checked my watch, and said, Did you find anything? If not, I'm out of here. I've got a conference call with Peter Knight in the London office. He's up to his waist in some sex scandal that's breaking in Parliament. Nothing as tawdry as that on Malia's phone, Sai said. And nothing that answers any questions. Too bad, I said, heading toward the door. But I found something that raises questions, he said, stopping me. From his breast pocket, Kloppenberg removed a SIM card in a smaller evidence sleeve, donned latex gloves, got it out, and inserted it into a reader attached to one of the lab computers. A second later, a picture popped up on the screen. The photo was date-stamped September 24, roughly a month prior, and showed a group shot that must have been taken on a location set for Saigon Falls, with jungle vegetation and a muddy river visible in the background, perhaps the Mekong. Tom Harlow was in the center of the picture, wearing Vietnam-era U.S. Army fatigues, looking ruggedly handsome and yet sincere, sympathetic, and lovable, traits that had made him a bankable box office star. Tom's arm was draped lazily around his wife's shoulder. Jennifer's dark hair was pulled back tight, revealing the remarkable bone structure of her face. She wore a white short-sleeved blouse, khaki shorts, and aviator sunglasses. A vintage Nikon camera hung off one shoulder. Her pose, her entire look, said smart, adventurous, and yet oozed mystery and sexuality, traits that had made her an even more bankable star than her husband. The children sat at their feet, arms around their knees. Malia and Jin were smiling. Miguel was looking off to his right somewhere. Cynthia Maines was there, too, standing slightly to the left of the family, carrying a clipboard. Camilla Bronson and Terry Graves were there as well. My attention, however, swung to and held on the only other person in the picture. Crouched above and behind the children, below and in front of Tom and Jennifer, she was stunningly exotic, mesmerizing in her own way, even in the shadow of Jennifer, a woman whom People magazine twice voted sexiest woman alive. Late teens, early twenties, she appeared to be at least partly Latina and partly Asian, with thick, shiny dark hair pulled back in a long braid, and skin the color of caramel. Her soft, doe eyes seemed to speak of sadness or some hidden wound, making her look entirely vulnerable, but her cheekbones, teeth, and full lips were set hard, as if beneath whatever haunted her, she was built of iron or steel. Who is she? I asked, gesturing at the photo. Exactly, Sai said. Chapter 75 Justine found the address Anita Fontana had given her around 10.30 that morning. It was a small, pale, blue fifties-era bungalow on a sleepy side street off Lancashire Boulevard in Burbank. She knocked at the door. A few moments later, a woman's voice called softly in Spanish. Who is there, please? It's Justine Smith, she replied. Anita called me. After a moment, she heard the deadbolt thrown. The door opened several inches on a security chain. Maria Toro, the Harlow's plump cook, looked out. She asked in English, Are you alone? Yes, Justine said. We think someone watches us, Maria whispered. Can you leave? Come back to Ali. Anita finds you there. Justine was confused, wondered if their paranoia was justified or invented, but nodded. Give me five minutes. She returned to her car as if she'd gotten the wrong address, trying to spot whoever they suspected of watching them but saw no one and no vehicle that stood out. She drove back to Lancashire, turned left, and then made an immediate left again into an alleyway that ran behind the bungalows. Anita Fontana stood in the alley by an open gate. She pointed to an open garage door on the opposite side of the alley, and Justine pulled in and parked. When Justine exited, the Harlow's housekeeper pointed a remote control device at the garage and the door lowered. Justine followed Anita through the gate into a yard that had seen better times. Untended orchid plants and a riot of cactus and vines crept onto the deck around a pool brimming with algae-green water. Who owns this place? 
Justine asked as she followed the Harlow's housekeeper through an open screen door into a dim room furnished with 1960s furniture and a shag rug. A television blared in the corner, cable coverage of the hunt for the Harlow's. Asinta Feliz, the youngest of the Harlow staff, sat on the couch, arms folded, watching Justine as she entered. I don't know this for sure, Anita said. How are the girls? And Miguel? The housekeeper asked this with a longing in her voice that impressed Justine with its intensity. You love them, don't you? asked Justine. Miguel? The girls? Anita's eyes glistened and she clasped her hands. See? I love Miguel. All of them. How could I? She choked and began to cry. Maria Toro, the cook, came up beside Anita, put her arm firmly around the housekeeper, looked fiercely at Justine. We all love the children, especially Anita. She has no children of her own. At that, Anita began to sob and hold herself tight, as if pierced with inner pain. Sit down, Justine soothed. It's okay. We'll figure out a way for you to see them, for all of you to see them, okay? Mr. Sanders, he say no, Anita wailed. I ask him, he say no. The poor woman was beside herself now. Jacinta Feliz had gone to her side, put her arm around the older woman, too. You will see those children, Justine said firmly. Have you been contacted by the FBI? No, no one, the cook said. We come here that same day we see you at the ranch, when they are just gone. We hear ever since. Someone brings us food. Miss Bronson, Mr. Sanders, they say they want to protect us from reporters. Say we stay here until things calm down. Justine heard her smartphone chime, telling her she'd received a text. She ignored it, said, This is America, ladies. Mr. Sanders and Camilla Bronson can't make you do anything. Do you understand? You all have green cards, yes? They shook their heads. We come on temporary visa. Ten month, said Maria Toro. How long have you worked for the Harlows? Justine asked, surprised. Twelve years. Anita said. Eight, said the cook. Four, said the maid. And they never offered to sponsor you to try to get citizenship? Justine was beginning to doubt the Harlow's public personas in a big way. Anita began to cry again, shaking her head. No, they don't do this for us. Did you ask? They all nodded. But Mr. Tom said they already bring in the children. It is difficult to get more through La Migra with them as sponsors. Maria Toro said. But he can get you the ten-month work visas. That is not a problem, I think, Jacinta said. Justine didn't know what to make of all of this. On its face, the fact that the Harlows were willing to get the women work visas but not green cards seemed lame, and counter to the Harlows' reputation. But then again, she wasn't at all well-versed in current U.S. immigration laws, quotas, and such. Anita wiped at her eyes, said, you can help us? Yes, of course, Justine said. Anything. Her phone chimed again. Hold on a second. She dug the phone from her purse and saw that she'd received a photo from Sai. She opened the file, looked at the group picture, read the text that accompanied it. Do you know who the young woman front row center is? Justine frowned, zoomed in on the woman, a girl, really. Gorgeous. But no, she didn't recognize her at all. She was about to text back negative when she had a different idea. Do you know this girl with the Harlows? She asked, turning the phone to show the three women. Maria Toro reached out, took the phone, studied the picture, and shook her head. She handed it to Anita, who looked at the photo with great suspicion, but then said, I no know her. Jacinta? Justine asked. The young maid took the phone, glanced at it, hesitated, then shook her head. She walked it back to Justine, who said, For a second there, you thought you knew her? No, Jacinta said. I was just thinking that maybe it was the nanny they hire after we leave and before they go for Vietnam. Chapter 76 At eleven minutes to noon that day, Johnson rollerbladed along Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. He wore white-framed sequin sunglasses with a built-in fiber-optic camera, pink stretch pants, 
a platinum blonde wig cut a la Marilyn, and, over a heavily padded bra, a white t-shirt that read, Blonde Ambition. But for a backpack carrying two suppressed pistols and four pink sweatbands on each forearm that hid spare clips, he could have been any old drag queen out for a skate on a fine October day. Location? Cobb asked through the earbud Johnson wore. Coming on to London Derry Place, turning north, Johnson replied, adding a little butt shake to his skate as he passed the patrons sitting outdoors at the Mexican place on the corner, as if he were listening to some throbbing Latin beat, instead of plotting with his co-conspirators to commit mass murder. London Derry Place climbs steeply north off the Sunset Strip. Johnson cut diagonally northwest across the narrow street to where the opposite sidewalk met a low chain-link fence. He straddle-vaulted it, landed in a thick ground cover atop a retaining wall that had been turned into a planter for five palm trees. Below him was a parking lot. Johnson took it in at a glance, seeing nine vehicles parked there in all, including one he wasn't expecting. He lowered himself four feet down the wall behind a blue Toyota sedan. LAPD cruiser in lot, empty, Johnson said. He skated out from behind the car, knelt in the wide open, pretended to retie his skates, but took glances at the cruiser and the entry to Mel's drive-in. Mr. Cobb? Take them first, Cobb said. If they're not outside, take them first. Johnson had been trained since the age of seventeen not only to follow orders, but also to adapt to evolving orders. He was what Mr. Cobb liked to call mission proficient. Johnson called it getting things done. The diner's exterior almost exactly matched the one in the 70s movie American Graffiti. Mel's was a chain now, but a good one that attracted tourists and locals alike. The initial plan had Johnson getting the guns out at the far end of the parking lot and then skating around toward the front of the diner and its terrace, which faced the Sunset Strip. But he kept the weapons in the pack for now, skated toward Mel's, eyes everywhere as he went left at the dog leg in the parking lot and back onto the sidewalk along Sunset heading west. He took in everyone eating on Mel's terrace before skating on past Dry Bar into a second entry to the parking lot. He'd seen a Hispanic couple and their kid, three duffers wearing golf jackets, and two moms with teenage daughters having ice cream sundaes. But no cops. Which meant they were inside. He glanced down at the rollerblades, which he decided to use because they had originally conceived this as an exterior job. Swoop in, execute, and leave. A new strategy evolved in Johnson's brain almost instantly. He skated back past the people eating outside and around into the entry to Mel's. A startled old woman wearing a green sweatshirt that featured a leaping trout and the words, Thief River Falls is Paradise, opened the door, carrying a pack of Marlboros. She gaped at him as he rolled past her into the diner, where he caught the full whiff of burgers frying, heard Elvis crooning from the jukebox, came face to face with a cheery hostess, who said brightly, No blades inside, ma'am. Uh, sir? Johnson had looked deeper into the diner, seen the two cops, male-female partners, sitting at the counter. A waitress had just served them cheeseburgers and fries. Ma'am, the hostess said, a big grin. Oh, honey cheeks, I know, Johnson said, turning to her and laying on a sweet, effeminate accent. I'll take them off for I eat, but this girl's gotta pay. Without waiting for an answer, Johnson darted by her toward the restrooms. Sir, the hostess called after him. Ma'am? But Johnson paid her no mind as he pushed into the men's room and let the door shut behind him. Finding an empty stall, he entered, got the guns from the pack, and put it back on. He held the suppressed pistols reversed, butts facing the front, palm to the action, fingers cradling the trigger guards, barrels flush to his lower forearms, a carry that often fooled the best trained of men and women, even if only for an extra moment or two. Stepping from the stall less than twenty-five seconds after he'd entered, Johnson said, Minute thirty, maybe less. He's waiting, Cobb said. From that point forward, Johnson did not pause. He pulled open the door, skated past a family of five chatting with the hostess. Dodging around them, he passed between a waitress filling a coffee pot next to the stainless kitchen door 
and a mom with three Cub Scouts. Never heard them giggling at him. Rolling now across the gray-green floor, seeing the cops in tunnel vision, Johnson crossed his hands, popped the left gun into the air, and let go of the right weapon. He grabbed the guns with opposite hands, unfolding his arms, swinging the suppressed barrels inward, past each other, and forward. He found the triggers and aimed at point-blank range. Chapter 77 Justine found Cynthia Maines just where she'd said she would be, in Burbank in the cafeteria on the Warner Brothers lot. It was late afternoon and the place was quiet, just a few people having coffee. Justine had not seen the Harlow's personal assistant since the children were released. She remembered how Maines had been angry, defiant. Now she appeared overwhelmed, sick, almost defeated. What's happening? Maines asked, as if she couldn't take any more. Justine had called Maines and requested the meeting, but she'd found over the years that understanding up front the state of mind of the person she was interviewing helped immensely during investigations. She said, Tell me what's going on with you first. Maines made a disgusted noise and gestured toward the cafeteria window. Evidently, I don't have an office at Harlow Quinn anymore. I was told to leave this morning. By Terry Graves? Maines nodded bitterly. Camilla and Dave were there, too. My God, I've known them all for more than ten years. They just cut me off. You tell this to the FBI? Of course, Maine said. And? They said that's their prerogative, and then asked me all this stuff that was all BS. Like? I don't know, Maine said, throwing her napkin on the table. About the studio and whether Warner and the other investors were freaking out wondering if all the money invested in Saigon Falls is gone. They said the studio execs hardly mentioned Tom or Jennifer, said it was just the money they were interested in, which is fucking depressing, you know? That all? No. They asked me the same kind of stuff you did, and about Terry and Camilla and Sanders and everyone who works at HQ. Tears began again. It's like I've been shipwrecked or something. Cut off. She choked. I miss Jen and Tom. This is the only job I've ever had, and I... Maines wept. Justine sighed and wondered about all the hurt that seemed to be going around lately. She moved to the other side of the table to hold the woman. Maines said, I feel helpless. I feel like people are blaming me. Helpless is a horrible place to be, Justine said, rubbing her back. Being blamed for things beyond your control is worse. Dealing with this sort of situation usually involves letting go and focusing on what you can control. Maines stilled, looked embarrassed, grabbed the napkin and wiped at her tears. I don't know what to do. How about helping me find the Harlows? That seemed to offer Maines some hope to grasp, because she said, Anything you want, any time you want, same as I told the FBI. Okay, Justine said, returning to her seat. Did you know about the secret passage off Jennifer's closet, the one that led down to Tom's editing room and also up to a panic room with a two-way mirror that overlooks their bedroom? Maines looked at Justine as if she'd been speaking Urdu. What? Justine described in detail what she'd found, including the empty camera brackets, the missing hard drives. Maines shook her head. We're assuming some of the drives had all the footage from the location shoot, Justine said. Is that a problem? No. Everything having to do with Saigon Falls was backed up every day to a server here, and there's another backup somewhere in Minneapolis. From the ranch, from Vietnam, from here, it didn't matter. Constant backups. Justine thought about that, set Saigon Falls aside for the moment, dug in her purse for her phone, and showed Maines the picture Sai had sent her. Who is she? Maines appeared momentarily transfixed looking at the photograph as if wrapped up in another time and place altogether. In a dazed tone, she said, I forgot her. In all this craziness, I completely forgot Adelita. Chapter 78 The two police officers having lunch at Mel's drive-in never knew what hit them. Just kind of sagged when the suppressed bullets blew through their skulls, 
and ricocheted off the counter. Officer Kate Wrangle slumped forward into her French fries. Her partner, Officer Lance Barfield, drifted off his green stool onto the floor. Bill Haley's rock around the clock was blasting from the jukebox, covering some of the noise, so Johnson was already ten feet beyond their corpses, looking for his next target. Two down, five to go. When one of the Cub Scouts realized what had happened and began to scream, like an infection spreading, more screams echoed as others joined him. The tranny's got guns! Someone shouted. You bet he does, sugar! Johnson yelled in that high, squeaky voice, before pulling the trigger of his right pistol twice, blowing side-by-side -side holes in the chest of a busboy, unfortunate enough to have been clearing a booth in his path. Pandemonium swept the diner, patrons and staff all wailing, diving to the floor, ducking beneath tables. Johnson skated calmly through the place toward the exit facing the strip. A steroidal punk came out low from behind a table, tried to knock Johnson off his blades. Johnson shot him left-handed, double-tapped to the crown of the skull. The man died, and the chaos began anew. Johnson heard pleas for mercy, cries of, No! Please, no! and the sort of foolish shout-outs to God that their kind always make when people around them get to dying. Johnson pushed open the glass door, stepped out onto the landing of the four-step stair that led down to the outdoor eating area. The people below him were on their feet, some running, others frozen, several crying now that they saw the pistols in his hands. He had to move now. Sirens would not be long in coming. He jumped the stairs, landed in a rolling crouch, shot two of the duffers, hitting both men in the back as they tried to flee. Angling hard right now between tables, oblivious to the screaming, he was thinking, six down, one to go. Johnson got over the low railing and onto the sidewalk, aware of cars rushing in both directions up and down the strip, oblivious to the bloody mayhem he was causing as they passed. His instinct was to kill whoever remained at the west end of the eating terrace, closest to Dry Bar. That would put him near the parking lot where Nickerson would be waiting with one of the vans. As Johnson swung the guns west, he spotted the old lady who'd gaped at him when he entered the diner, the one wearing the sweatshirt promoting a trout paradise. She was squared off in a horse stance, twelve feet away, both hands wrapped around a small caliber pistol. You get down now! She yelled at him in a hoarse voice. I have passed an NRA handgun self-defense course. I will shoot you! An NRA course? What was that? A weekend? Two? Johnson almost laughed. The truth was that unless you were deranged or enraged, it took a lot of training to be able to actually shoot someone in cold blood. Most first-timers just yanked the trigger and threw the shot wide. Knowing that, Johnson took his chance. He grinned at her, said, Sure, Grandma! Dropped his right pistol and whipped the left one up at her. He was aware of the old woman blinking as the shot went off. Her bullet hit Johnson's ribcage, passed below the heart, through the lung, where it expelled its energy before blowing out his back. The second pistol dropped. Johnson crumpled to the sidewalk after it, coughing up the blood already drowning him, dying in surging disbelief, utterly baffled by the fact that he had lived through so many days of full-on combat in his life with hardly a scratch to show for it like he'd had some invisible shield around him. And yet, here he was, shot down in drag by some pistol-packing grandma sheepitch from Thief River Falls. Chapter 79 I got the call from Chief Fesco about the latest no-prisoners attack twelve minutes after it went down, almost as soon as he understood the scope of the massacre and the nature of the victims. I've got two of my own dead down there. Fesco said, sounding rattled. I'm on my way there with the forensics team. So is Townsend. But both our departments are spread thin. It won't be enough. We'd like a team of York techs if we can get them. Right away, I promised, and within nine minutes, Sai, Mobot, the kid, and three other techs were with me, driving as fast as we dared from our offices to the Sunset Strip. The block between London Dairy Place and Sunset Plaza Drive was taped off. The full-on media carnival was yet to arrive, but the sideshow was already set up and running. As we moved gear inside the police lines from the east, Bobby Newton was on air, having a best friends forever moment with June Wanta, the 67-year-old grandmother of ten who'd shot and killed the gunman who'd rampaged through Mel's. 
Where's your gun, June? Bobby Newton asked breathlessly. I gave it to the police, of course, Wanta said, nervously lighting a Marlboro, puffing. The smoke went in Bobby Newton's face, made her unhappy, but she moved upwind and gushed. You're a hero, June. How does it feel? I'm no hero, the old woman said, taking another puff. Her hands were trembling. I just defended myself from a crazy fool the way anyone who'd taken an NRA handgun course would. The crowd that had gathered broke into laughter and cheers. Bobby Newton, however, looked at the grandmother as if she'd suddenly sprouted a set of horns. Then she peered into the camera, said, Yes, see there, friends, the value of education. It never ceases to amaze me. Turning back to the grandmother, Bobby said, Now, I understand you came face to face with the shooter before he started, uh, shooting. That's right, Wanta said, took a drag off her cigarette. How are you sure it was him? The grandmother looked at Bobby Newton like she was a ninny, said, Back home in Thief River, you don't see too many black guys dressed up like Marilyn Monroe does the roller derby. The crowd roared. Mrs. Wanta looked over, puffed, smiled, waved, and then said, Gotta go now, Bobby. Police want to talk to me. She turned, walked away, smoke trailing her. The crowd cheered more loudly. There you go, Bobby Newton said, grinning inanely at the camera. A reluctant hero blows away the bad guy and saves who knows how many lives in the process. I have the feeling we're going to be hearing much more from Mrs. June Wanta. A star is born. Can we say movie deal? Why does everything have to end up with a movie deal in L.A.? Mobot snorted as we moved away into the crime scene. Company town, I replied before spotting Fesco and FBI special agent in charge, Christine Townsend, emerging from Mel's drive-in. It's carnage in there, Jack, Fesco said, clearly shocked. Son of a bitch supposedly skated through the place shooting anyone he pleased. Until he got to Grandma, I said. Wish there were more like her, Townsend said, looking over at Mrs. Wanta, who was lighting another cigarette and listening to a detective's questions. We wanted Cy to process the shooter's body, Fesco said, gesturing toward the sidewalk and the corpse of the wiry crossdresser. That's his specialty, right? Among many others, I replied, motioning Kloppenberg, Mobot, and the rest of their team toward the dead killer. You think he's no prisoners? Fesco shrugged. Haven't seen the calling card yet, but he did try to kill seven people. Doesn't look anything like the guy at the CVS. Special Agent Townsend shrugged. Maybe he wore makeup in the CVS job and this is over. No, Fesco said. Jack's right. This guy's got a different facial structure. Then this isn't over, I said. The dead guy, whoever he is, is just one of any number of people, at least two, who could be behind this entire... Fesco's phone rang. The chief turned away, answered. Anything new on the Harlows? I asked Townsend. Nothing hard, she replied. You? I've got a guy flying to Panama. You have unlimited resources or something? What can I say? They pissed me off. That was the mayor, Fesco said, interrupting, sweating now. No prisoners has made contact, demanding three million or eight more will die. Chapter 80 Inside the garage in the City of Commerce, Cobb and the other three remaining members of No Prisoners were glued to the coverage of the shootings at Mel's drive-in. CNN's Anderson Cooper had been in L.A. already to report on the Harlow case and had rushed to the scene. So had affiliates from every major news network, all of them leading with footage of June Wanta smoking, listening to their questions skeptically, cracking jokes, and consistently downplaying any idea that she was a hero. You have no idea what kind of broad I am, she said, rasping in laughter at Anderson Cooper, who didn't seem to know what to make of her. Neither did Cobb, who felt like he wanted to pick something up and smash it. Johnson had been his best man, the one who'd been with him the longest, the most loyal friend he'd ever had. It was Johnson who'd carried Cobb, seen to his medical care after the explosion that turned his face into a spider's web. I don't get it, Hernandez said. How does a chain-smoking grandma from Minnesota kill Johnson? 
Anderson Cooper asked virtually the same question on screen. The old lady didn't miss a beat. She pulls the trigger, Mrs. Wanta said. Cobb wanted to reach through the screen and throttle the bitch, who went on to reveal to Cooper that she was in Los Angeles, seeing the sights alone because my damn fool of a husband, Barney, wouldn't get out of his... Cobb couldn't take her anymore and muted the screen. Watson was gazing at him. We still good, Mr. Cobb? Cobb felt the others watching him, looking to him for leadership. You think we're jeopardized because they've got Johnson's body? The other three men shrugged or nodded. Fear not, gentlemen, Cobb said. I believe we're still good to go for quite a while yet. I mean, we don't officially exist, do we? Isn't that what they did to us? Stripped us of everything? Threw us to the hyenas? They did, Mr. Cobb, Kelleher said, anger flaring across his face. And thorough bastards they were about it. So what exactly makes any of you think they can identify us, let alone locate and catch us before we're finished here and long gone? Chapter 81 After nine that night, I returned to the office for a conference call with Mattie Engel in Private's Berlin office regarding an embezzlement case she'd been working on for nearly a month on behalf of Sherman Wilkerson our client who lived above the beach where the first no-prisoners' bodies were found. I hung up believing that Engel had the situation well in hand and would be ready to file a full report to Sherman sometime the following. A knock. I looked up, saw Justine, felt that little pang I always get in my chest when I haven't seen her in a while. Got a minute? she asked. Absolutely, I said. I was going to have a drink. Want one? Oh, God, I'd love one, she said, coming in and sitting down hard in an overstuffed chair by the couch. As I reached into my lower desk drawer to get out a bottle of Middleton Very Rare Irish Whiskey, I was thinking again that something had changed about her recently, aged her in a way I'd never seen before. I handed her a glass with two fingers of Middleton in it neat. She took a sip, closed her eyes, and said, That helps. You saw that no prisoners struck again? I asked. Heard it on the radio. Some grandmother killed him? We believe no prisoners is several people acting in concert. The dead guy's just one of them. ID yet? Cy and Mobot are working with the FBI on that. Her eyebrows rose. So we're back on that case again? Just the lab for now, I said. But there's a twist in the demand no prisoners made to the mayor that might bring us in deeper. A twist you can't discuss? For now, I said. She nodded absently. You wanted to tell me something? I said. If not, I was going to head over to see Rick. Justine startled, confused, but then nodded. That picture Sai sent me? I know who the mystery girl is. Her name is Adelita. I'll tell you her last name later. Intrigued now, I sat in a chair across the coffee table from her, sipped the whiskey, and listened as she told me all she'd learned about Adelita from Cynthia Maines. Six weeks before the Harlows were to fly to Saigon for filming, Maines was sent over to organize the family's living arrangements and to hire a staff in Vietnam. She was not there when Adelita came into the Harlows' life. Jennifer was always hiring and firing nannies, Usually one a year, sometimes two. She'd fired her last nanny twelve days before the family was to fly to Vietnam, and no one she'd interviewed in the meantime suited her. Enter Adelita. She'd only been in Los Angeles three days, here on a student visa from Mexico to study acting for six months. She had defied her parents on her 18th birthday and used a small inheritance from her grandmother to fund a plane ticket, a few months' rent, and the acting lessons. Eight days before their flight to Vietnam, the Harlows were at their Westwood apartment, staging up before the big move overseas. Adelita ran into Jennifer Harlow, one of her acting idols, on the sidewalk outside a deli. Jennifer was harried, trying to deal with Miguel, who was throwing a fit, while she juggled a phone call regarding Saigon Falls. Starstruck as she was, Adelita charmed Miguel into calming down. Impulsive, perceptive, Jennifer talked to Adelita, took her to lunch with the children, got her to admit she wanted to be an actress. Jennifer offered her the job as a nanny, 
Justine said, reaching to pour herself more whiskey. The idea was that she'd get to see the world and get to really understand the life of an actor. I said, Sounds like the offer of a lifetime. One of those fated meetings you used to hear took place at soda fountains where stars found their fortunes. Right? Justine said. Anyway, Maines said Adelita accepted, flew to Saigon with them a week later. She said Adelita was great with the kids, and the entire family seemed to love her. The nanny was evidently a pretty good actress as well. They gave her a minor role in the film. She plays the daughter of an American diplomat fleeing Saigon as the Viet Cong advance. Where is she, Adelita? I asked. I'm coming to that, Justine said, taking another large draw on the whiskey, which surprised me because I'd never seen her drink like this before. Maine said something happened to Adelita about halfway through the nine months in Vietnam. The girl who had been so enthralled by the Harlow's world, so excited to be given a part in their film, became infinitely more subdued. She worked just as hard, cared for the children just as well, but something was definitely off about her. Maines tried to get her to open up once, but Adelita forcefully shut her down, Justine continued. In any case, before they returned from Vietnam, Adelita was offered the same vacation Cynthia was, three weeks off with a bonus of an additional three weeks' pay. She took them up on the deal and left Saigon two days before Maine's and the Harlow's. Where did Adelita go? I asked. Home, Justine said, closing her eyes. Mexico. Guadalajara, in fact. Really? I said, piecing some of it together. So what's her last name? Gomez, Justine said, eyes still closed but wincing. Same last name as the Jalisco State Police Captain who put Cruz and me in jail down there. Chapter 82 Before I could put that information into context, Sai knocked at my door jam, entered. He saw the Middleton bottle. That looks good. You look like you could use a snort, Justine said, turning in her seat. A snort, I said. Well, I don't know, she said, reaching for the bottle again. What else do you call it? Snort will do, Kloppenberg said, taking the bottle from her after she'd poured a fifth and sixth finger of the whiskey. Any luck on identifying the shooter? I asked as Sai got a glass. No, he said, which is why I'm here. Yet another knock came at my door. Mobot entered, yawning, but looked at Sai pouring, said, Gimme one of those. Another strikeout? Sai asked, pouring her a glass. Total wall, she said. Even dental records. One of you want to tell me what you're talking about? I asked. Sai handed Mobot her drink and plopped down beside her on the couch, said, So we had beautiful fingerprints, all the DNA material anyone could need, dental picks, you name it, and nothing. Well, something, Mobot said. But what it is isn't exactly clear. You sound like you've been drinking already, Justine observed with a slight slur. Mobot sipped her whiskey, sighed with pleasure, and then explained that when they'd run the fingerprints and dental records of the dead homicidal drag queen through various law enforcement databases around the world, they'd gotten a positive match. And, I said. And nothing, Sai said. What do you mean, nothing? Justine asked. It's like the database freezes and doesn't let us go forward, Mobot said. You're being blocked? I asked. I wouldn't say blocked, Sai said. More like frozen. Mobot nodded. It's like there's still an echo or a ghost of that guy's fingerprints in the system that's being recognized, but everything else about him has been scrubbed clean. Is that possible? Well... Totally corrupted, at least, Sai said. What database did you freeze in? I asked. Kloppenberg pursed his lips, said, U.S. Department of Defense Personnel Records, past ten years. I slapped my leg. I said this felt like military guys from the get-go. But which military guys? Justine asked loudly, the slur stronger. Bud Rankin was an ex-Marine. He would have known how to figure it out. And you know, 
Why aren't we raising a toast to poor Bud Rankin? She'd had too much already. But I nodded, said, To Bud, an old soul who will be missed. Hear, hear, they all muttered and downed their drinks. When this is over, we'll have a proper memorial for Bud, I said. Justine reached again for the bottle. I slid it away from her, said, Why don't I get you home for some much-needed rest? She raised her finger at me, trying to focus, trying to argue, but then licked her lips and nodded. I put the empty glass on my desk and turned back to her, seeing the amusement on size and Mobot's faces. Justine was out cold, already snoring. Chapter 83 It was almost midnight before I reached UCLA Medical Center. I got past security by showing my private ID. We've done pro bono work for the hospital in the past, which helps when we want access at odd hours. I reached the floor of the ICU, my mind whirling with everything that had unfolded during the day, including several things Justine had said to me before I was able to get her back to her apartment, into her bed, under the covers, lights off with a bucket by the nightstand. In my car on the way there, she'd roused from her stupor. Love you, Jack, she mumbled. Thanks. I love you too, Justine, and no problem. She shook her head. Can't work, though. Us. I know. Joy and Luck, her female Jack Russell Terriers, kept jumping up on her bed and whining after I'd laid her in bed fully clothed. Justine's eyes were glassy and roaming as she soothed the dogs into lying beside her. Sorry. For what? You had a few too many. I was glad to bring you home. Her eyes closed. Not about that, she said. Go to sleep, Justine. I'll let the girls out. Talk to you in the morning. I had... I had sex with this perfect... No, not perfect stranger. And I'm not perfect stranger. And... She passed out again, and I walked the dogs and headed for the hospital, feeling oddly hollowed out by her convoluted drunken confession. Justine having sex with not perfect strangers, getting drunker than I'd ever seen her? What the hell was going on? That question was still bouncing through my brain when I went through the ICU doors and saw Angela, Del Rio's Filipina guardian angel, glaring at me from inside the nursing station. He's sleeping, she hissed. You can't go in there. I held up my fingers in a cross and hurried past her. I could hear her clogs clip-clopping after me all the way to Del Rio's room. Ducking inside, I found him sitting up, watching Anderson Cooper's interview with June Wanta. You see this? he asked, laughing. Crazy old lady. I stopped at the foot of his bed, looked to my right, saw Angela coming, said, Speak of the devil. Del Rio laughed again, and then said, Angela, it's okay. I couldn't sleep, and this guy's so boring to listen to, he's better than pills or counting sheep. She thought about that, shot me another hostile glance, said, You cannot sleep here. UCLA Medical Center is no Super 8. I'll leave when he conks out, I promised, and waited until she left before taking a chair. How are you? Lift the sheets, Del Rio said. I did, and was amazed to see him moving both of his feet ever so slightly. I said, Keep this up. You'll be back dancing with the Bolshoi in no time. The Bolshoi? Twyla Tharp? Better, he said. River dance? You better quit while you're ahead. The banter between us felt good. Everything in that room felt good. And I was grateful. Despite all the strange and disturbing things I'd faced during the day, Del Rio was on the mend, and my best friend forever was in good enough spirits to crack wise with me. What do I need to know? Del Rio asked. Get me up to speed. I told him everything that had happened during the course of the day from the time I'd left his hospital room until my return. Mobot's discovery of the bank account and shell company in the Caymans feeding millions to Harlow Quinn Productions. Justine's chats with the maids and with Cynthia Maines about Adelita Gomez. I gave him all of it, except for Justine's drunken admission that she loved me but couldn't be with me, and that she'd had sex with a not-perfect stranger, or something to that effect. 
When I told Del Rio what Sai and Mobot had found when they tried to place the fingerprints of the shooter at Mel's drive-in, he said, Sounds like someone's expunged the file. Yeah, but why? FBI's getting nowhere with DOD on this either. They're saying there are no files, that the system is throwing false positives. Del Rio blinked, looked off into memory, said, There is someone who might be able to tell us if they're lying or not. You'd know someone who'd know something like that? You know him too, Jack, or did. Back in Kandahar? I thought about that. Flashed on a face from our Afghanistan days before the helicopter crash. A big, doughy, cherub-faced man with cold, dark eyes. A fellow I'd once heard accurately described as having the look of an angel and the heart of an assassin. Guy Carpenter, I said. The one and only. That was ten years ago. I wouldn't begin to know where to find someone like him. He's an ultra-spook, for God's sake. Ultra-spook or not, Del Rio said. I got his address and phone number. What? How? I asked, incredulous. Del Rio shot me a look of pity. Guess you didn't make the assassin's list of friends and loved ones, Jack, but Carpenter sends yours truly a Christmas card each and every year. Chapter 84 Justine woke at a quarter past five the next morning with a colossal hangover, dominated by a meat cleaver of a headache and a mouth that tasted of very rare Irish whiskey and dried Elmer's glue. How in God's name did I get... She remembered being in Jack's office on an empty stomach, whiskey that tasted oh so incredibly good and made her feel even better. And then it all went whirly on her. And then, dark. She reached out, felt the dogs. One of them licked her hand. Why did I... How did I... Justine flashed on Jack, bringing her into the apartment in a fireman's carry, and vaguely recalled saying something about, Oh, God, she groaned into her pillow. Please don't let that be true. But was it? Had she confessed to Jack something about having perfect sex with a stranger, or something like that? Oh, God, she groaned again. Why? What am I going to... And then she knew. Hangover or not, world-class headache or not, she was getting up. She was going to CrossFit. She was confronting what she'd done and what it meant, and she was doing it now, not later. This was the kind of thing the old Justine would have done without hesitation. But why did she feel like this could be worse than returning to that jail cell in Guadalajara? Twenty minutes later, after chugging a quart of water and swallowing a banana walnut muffin, two shots of espresso, and an olive, she pulled up to the CrossFit box, still unable to answer that question. She absolutely did not want to go inside. She knew the workout might force her to her knees, make her retch her insides out, but in a way, that kind of suffering felt fitting, a penance for her shitty choices of late, whatever their root cause. Justine got out of the car, feeling only slightly less queasy than she had upon waking. Her ears rang, her eyes felt swollen. Was that possible? She trudged into the box, glanced around, seeing most of the regulars, but no Paul. She tried to smile at the trainer, said, Did your sister have the baby, Ronnie? Girl, he said, grinning. Elena, six pounds, eleven ounces. Thanks for taking care of the place for me, telling everyone there was no class that day. Only a couple of people showed anyway, she said. Yeah. Paul said you and he did a workout with a bunch of pull-ups and push-ups, the trainer said. Too many, he said. He strained his back. Oh, Justine said, feeling her head pounding again. That's too bad. Ready for this? Ronnie asked. Justine turned her head to look at the whiteboard, saw the workout of the day posted there, and shuddered at the simple name. Fran. Some CrossFit workouts had been given names, women's names because they were like hurricanes. Of all the hurricanes, nothing was worse than Fran, which involved racing the clock to complete 21 thrusters, a move where you had to hold a 65-pound barbell at your collarbone, squat, then explode the weight up overhead. 
Then you had to do 21 pull-ups, then 15 thrusters, then 15 pull-ups, then 9 thrusters, then 9 pull-ups. Okay, little sister, Justine thought miserably. You're about to suffer for your sins in a big, big way. Chapter 85 Justine finished Fran in 9 minutes 40 seconds a time that included two trips to the washroom to hurl the poisons from her system. But as she lay on the floor of the box, sweating like a horse, incapable of moving, her abs, hams, and shoulders on fire, she felt better for having suffered. She had deserved to suffer. Know what I like about you, Justine? Ronnie said. What's that? she croaked. You don't give up, the trainer said, grinning. You come in hung over to the gills, Visit with Mr. Pukey twice, and you still go the whole nine yards. I like that in a person. Call me crazy, but I like someone who finishes what they start, no matter what. She managed a soft grin. Thanks, Ronnie. I think. I'll let you know when my body stops twitching. The sun was up by the time Justine walked stiffly from the box. Her brain felt slightly scalded, but her head no longer pounded. Her stomach was much better, and she'd sweated most of the booze out of her system. She sat in her car, drank another quart of water, tried to figure out what to do. Sooner the better. Now, not later. Those old maxims guided Justine more than her emotions as she put the car in gear and drove through the streets toward the Bonaventure Charter School in Clarkdale, about six miles away. Bonaventure was housed in a retrofitted apartment building on Mentone Avenue that had been bequeathed to the school's founder by a wealthy aunt. Mission-style and stucco-finished, the school sat back from the road, fronted by a beautifully tented flower garden crisscrossed by brick walkways. It was still early, only 7.15, and the schoolyard stood empty. Justine parallel parked across and down the street where she could see the walkways, she rolled down her window to get some air, hoping to spot Paul coming in before his students, hoping to right the course of her life somehow, or at least to find out exactly where the harsh winds of fate had brought her. The first student, eight or nine, an African-American girl dressed in a school uniform of gray plaid skirt and white collared shirt, came down the sidewalk with her mother ten minutes later. She gave her mother a hug before skipping toward the school. The girl put Justine very much in mind of Malia, the Harlow's oldest daughter, and then of Jin and Miguel, and how they might be feeling more than a week into the disappearance of their parents, and four days into life under the control of Dave Sanders. Orphans to begin with, they had to be shocked and upended by finding themselves in that same wretched state again, alone at such a young age, trying to find an anchor, trying to cope trying to survive a nightmare ordeal. Seeing the children's faces in her mind, Justine couldn't help feeling admiration for the Harlows. Yes, there were things about Tom and Jennifer that she found troubling, not helping the women who worked for them to obtain citizenship, and those camera brackets in the roof of the panic room aiming into their bedroom. But at the same time, when they really didn't have to, the Harlows had adopted three needy orphans, and had started up a foundation for the benefit of parentless children the world over. Justine tapped her fingers on the steering wheel, wondering about the foundation, realizing it was the only aspect of Tom's and Jennifer's lives that they knew little about. Justine had seen the commercials, and the pictures of one or both of the Harlows in some far-flung and impoverished land, invariably holding a malnourished but utterly adorable child. The Harlows built schools and dorms and improved water resources for... Justine's attention wrenched to the street. Paul's blue Toyota Camry was pulling up to the curb in front of one of Bonaventure's walkways. He climbed out of the passenger side, grinning, looking tousle-haired and handsome as usual. But Justine barely gave him a second glance. She was staring horrified at the pretty blonde woman behind the steering wheel and the two young children sitting in car seats behind her. The mom blew a kiss to Paul, who caught it and then walked toward the school, his right hand massaging his lower back. The Toyota pulled away and drove just past Justine. 
The woman's window was down. She was looking in the rearview mirror at her children, a boy, a girl, neither more than three. They were all singing, The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. Oh, my God, Justine whispered, her eyes brimming with bitter tears, her cheeks burning with utter shame. What have I done? Chapter 86 No prisoners sent an email that appears, like the others, untraceable for the time being. Mayor Wills informed a conference room crowded with city, county, state, and federal law enforcement. They said they no longer wish to be paid in cash. Shortly after dawn, Mickey Fesco had called to alert me to this meeting, waking me from a dead sleep in my own bedroom, a first since Del Rio had been injured. Fesco briefed me on no prisoners' demands. I'd suggested I bring Kloppenberg and Maureen Roth along to get their perspective, and he'd agreed. The three of us were standing against the back wall of the room, strictly observers, possibly advisors. How do they want it, then? Sheriff Camerata demanded. Electronic transfer of funds, the mayor said somberly. We'll be texted or emailed an account number and routing information then have ten minutes to respond with payment. If we arrange to pay today, it's seven million dollars. If we don't arrange to pay by midnight, the fee jumps to ten million. If we don't arrange to pay by tomorrow midnight, eight will die. A grumble rolled through the room as people tried to get their heads around no prisoners' demands, see angles to those demands that might be exploited. To my surprise, when the grumbling drifted towards silence, Mobot was the first to offer advice. Mayor, if I were you, I'd be willing to move ten million tomorrow, she said quite loudly and forcefully. That offended Sheriff Camerata, who looked at me and demanded, Does she toss around ten million dollars in public money all the time, Morgan? But the mayor seemed surprised and looked at Mobot with great interest. Why would I do that, Miss Roth? Mobot shot the sheriff a belittling smile said, because by waiting until tomorrow you'll give us time to attach a digital bug to the transfer file, a bug that will follow that money wherever it goes, making the money retrievable. Even FBI Special Agent Christine Townsend seemed impressed. She looked at me. Private can do that? I don't even think we can do that. In all honesty, I didn't think so. But before I could reply, Sai said, well, not private, exactly, but friends of Maureen's, folks from Cal Poly that we keep on retainer. I imagine they could put something like that together lickety-split. Imagine, I thought, lickety-split. I wondered if that was true. I mean, it was true that Private did have on retainer top scientists at Cal Poly, Stanford, and Berkeley. Whether they could devise a digital bug that would do what Mobot and Cy were suggesting, and overnight, was another story. But I said, I think it's worth a 15-minute phone call on Marine's part to make sure this is, indeed, possible. Go ahead, Miss Roth, Mayor Will said, and Mobot left the room. What about the money? asked the FBI special agent in charge. Where are you going to get $10 million to transfer, even if you can get it back? Wills hesitated, then threw up her hands. I honestly don't know what I can do without opening myself up to a lawsuit, or worse, criminal charges, should we fail to get the money back. You could ask private citizens, Hollywood, Chief Fesco said. Give them some kind of guarantee on the loan of the funds. The mayor didn't like that either, and I didn't blame her. No prisoners had killed 21 people, including two police officers. Going to private citizens for the money smacked of an inability to handle the situation. Not a good thing for a politician with aspirations to higher office. You could call the governor, said Bill Ikeda, who was representing the criminal division of the California Department of Justice. Under these circumstances, he might be willing to authorize having the funds drawn from one of the general accounts, as long as the transfer carries this bug, I mean. We don't know if this bug will work, the sheriff complained. We're... Mobot re-entered the room. She was sipping a cup of coffee, noticed all eyes on her, and stopped. What? Can they make the bug? the mayor asked. Oh, she said, as if she'd been thinking of something else. Of course. How much is this bug going to cost? 
Townsend asked me. Nothing, I replied. Private won't take a dime for this, and neither will the computer scientists. We want to catch these guys and make L.A. safe again as much as you do. Chapter 87 I've got your back, but you're going to have to take the lead on this, I told Mobot as we exited City Hall, heading for our cars around 9.30 that morning. How soon can the Cal Poly boys be here? They're all women, she shot back. And they're on their way already, working in their car, if I know them. The key, of course, is where the money is coming from and the nature of the files and security codes that surround transfers from whatever fund they end up tapping. I said, I just want to know it'll work. It'll work, Sai said. Think of it like a tick. You mean as in dog tick? Or deer tick, or in this case, digital file tick, he replied. The program they'll devise will be tiny and will attach itself deep in the metadata of the transfer file. To any but the most sophisticated of coders, it will look simply like a string of numbers, an afterthought. Mobot nodded. The tick will also have the ability to replicate itself, so one of its offspring will travel in the metadata of each subsequent transfer, on and on. Kind of like a computer virus, but not. So how do we get the money back? The tick will be programmed to transmit a location back at each stop, each account, Sai said. No matter how many times the money's transferred? That's the idea, Mobot said. Okay, I said. I'm impressed. I didn't know we could do that sort of thing. Learn something new about your company every day, Jack, Sai said. We'd reached the parking garage by then, and I told them I'd meet them back at the offices. I wanted to swing by Justine's. She'd called in sick, and I wanted to see how bad her hangover had turned out. As I climbed into the Tuareg, my cell rang. I fired the ignition so the Bluetooth function on the stereo connected before answering. Morgan. Is that you, Jack, my California friend? Came a male voice soaked in the Caribbean. It had been a while, but I recognized it. I backed out of the parking space, heading for the exit. I believe I'm speaking with Carlos Sanciello. Long time, Jack. Sanciello replied. I'm calling from the Caymans. Lucky you. Beautiful day here, he said. Thanks for the assignment. Thought of you first. Hope you found something. The detective hesitated. I did, but it cost you a bit more than my ordinary retainer and daily fee. How's that? I asked. The shithead attorney down here, the filing agent, Sanciello replied. He tells me he can't divulge the names of the owners of this E.S.H. Limited, even after I lie and tell him I represent Mr. Deep Pockets, who wants to make many of these phony corporations. Okay, I said, driving out of the parking garage and heading toward the Harbor Freeway, Santa Monica, and Justine's house. Another pause. I had to pay him five grand to get him to cough up what you wanted to know. I'll pay it, I said, weaving through traffic. Who's behind E.S.H.? Sanciello whistled, said, I cannot believe it when he said it, so I asked to see the Articles of Incorporation for my own eyes. Out with it, Carlos. I'm a busy man, I said. Oh, yes, of course, Jack. It is just that I am not so used to Tom and Jennifer Harlow and the David Sanders and the Terry Graves. They own this LTD called ESH. I left the freeway really confused. The Harlows and their attorney and head of production had moved money through an offshore corporation to their own company? Why? I suppose there had to be certain tax benefits, but then why had Sanders claimed that the Harlows were almost bankrupt when they had access to millions offshore? And why had Sanders lied about it in the first place? He'd told us that Tom Harlow claimed to have a new secret investor who was willing to front him enough money to finish Saigon Falls, and yet, the financial records clearly showed that the $27 million transferred to Harlow Quinn Productions came from another Harlow-owned concern. Why? Was that how the investor wanted it? Was he or she offshore to begin with? Jack? I'm here, I said finally. Did you ask the attorney how much money the company had? Of course, Sanciello replied. The answer cost you another five grand. Another, I replied, turning a corner. How much did this conversation cost me altogether? A hesitation. Uh, 
plenty and all. Twenty, I said, my eyebrows rising. This had better be good information, Carlos, or I'll have to seriously reconsider our business relationship. No, no, Jack, it is the best information money can buy about this ESH Limited, San Cielo assured me. The agent was very happy, after all, to show me and to make copies of records. Much money in ESH. More all the time. From where? From who? Many places and companies and peoples from all over the world, he replied. There is currently another 23 million in account of ESH Limited in Panama. 23 million. That it? Well, I scan and send all records to your office. You can see for yourself where money comes from. Do that, I replied, turning onto Justine Street. Send them to Maureen Roth. The Mobot! Yes, of course. Within two hour stops. Carlos? Yes, Jack? He replied, sounding a tad defensive. Good job. Glad to do business with you. I could almost hear him smile from 4,000 miles away. I look forward to representing private's interests in the future. I'll let you know, I said, pulling into Justine's steep driveway. I hung up, parked, set the brake, and sat there a moment, car still running, thinking that there could be another explanation for the money in ESH Limited's accounts and for its sources. The Harlows were international superstars. They made movies all over the world. Their movies were shown all over the world, generated income from all over the world. It probably made sense in a lot of ways to have a company with an account offshore, someplace tax neutral, or something like that. I was still dwelling on that scenario as I started to climb out of the SUV, figuring I'd check on Justine at the door, be on my way, no need to even shut the motor off. So I was barely aware that another vehicle had stopped in the street behind me, and that a man in dark denim clothing was climbing from the car. But as I took that first step, turning to close the door, I caught a glimpse of something in the man's hand, and felt panic explode when he swung a suppressed pistol at me. Chapter 88 They decide it is better to pay ten million dollars than seven. Cobb said quietly when Alice, the waitress who had taken their lunch order, walked away. Why? He and the rest of his men, Watson, Nickerson, Hernandez, and Kelleher, sat in a booth at the Robbie Eden Cafe on Atlantic Avenue. The cafe offered burgers and interesting sandwiches, but more importantly, it was less than a mile from the garage where they'd been living the past two months. In that time, they'd become regulars at Robbie Eden's, wearing olive green work clothes that made them part of the crew at L.A. Standard Demolition, a fictional service devised to allow them to move about unnoticed. Cobb looked out from behind the heavy makeup and the dark glasses he wore in addition to the uniform, peered around the table at his men, still waiting for an answer. Only a few minutes before, they'd seen the phrase, Ten Tomorrow, appear on the city's website, notifying them of the mayor's decision. Ten million is a lot these days, no matter who you are, Mr. Cobb, Kelleher offered. Probably take time for them to get the money together. Sounds right to me, Hernandez said. Who cares, Nickerson said. It's ten million, right? Which is a lot better than seven million. Or am I missing something? We're not after seven million or ten million, Mr. Nickerson, Cobb said. Yes, I know, Mr. Cobb, Nickerson replied but that might be all we get if they don't move the money out of some big government account. Cobb shook his head. That's where it will come from, and they'll try to trace the money. You don't know, Watson began. We do know, Mr. Watson, by deductive reasoning, Cobb insisted. It only makes sense, which is why you're going to send that money off into oblivion, and while they're chasing that paltry ten million, you're going to have the account codes and passwords necessary to steal them blind. Whatever is in the big account, however much we want. What if there's nothing? Hernandez demanded skeptically. Not a cent beyond ten million, Mr. Cobb. With no hesitation, Cobb said, Isn't it obvious, Mr. Hernandez? We'll call the scammers on trying to track the money, and Mr. Kelleher will step up to take no prisoners out for a spin again. Sounds like a plan, Nickerson said, raised his hand, and called to the waitress. Say, Alice, can we get our check? 
Chapter 89 I did the only thing I could think of, ducked and threw myself back into the car, hearing the spit and ping of the suppressed round shattering the driver's side window of the Tuareg, then another smacking the door as I yanked in my legs, adrenaline surging, trying to get to my gun. But I couldn't reach it, and I could hear footsteps. Lying across the bucket seat and the central console, I saw the emergency brake lever, released it. The door was still open as the heavy Tuareg almost immediately began to drop back down the steep drive, slapping the side of the guy trying to kill me. He swore in Russian, wild-eyed, trying to stop my vehicle and get a clean shot at me. I slammed the shift into reverse, kicked the gas pedal, pinned the shooter against the door, dragging him as we went flying backward into the street, hurling him from my sight when we crashed broadside into his car with a sound like a dump truck dropping its gate. On impact, I'd been slammed back against the seats, but I came up fast, dug for my pistol, kicked my way out through the door and up into a squared-off shooter's stance, sweeping the... He was sprawled, grunting, on the road beside an older Pontiac Trans Am that was making coughing noises and backfiring. His gun lay eight feet from him. I kicked it farther away into the gutter, noticed that his right leg was grotesquely broken, and now bright blood bubbled at one corner of his lips. Behind me I could hear Joy and Luck, Justine's terriers, barking wildly inside her house. Why'd you try to kill me? I asked. Fuck you! He rasped. I kicked him in the broken leg, barely aware of people coming out of their houses, happy to hear him scream, or at least try. Why? I asked again. Or this time I'll stomp on your leg. There is no way, he said in a thick Russian accent. I do job, heard. By who? I demanded. Who wanted me? The Russian got a look of disbelief on his face, coughed up a gout of that bright, frothy blood, and died there in the back streets of Santa Monica, right in front of Justine's house. Chapter 90 An hour earlier, Justine was sitting in an overstuffed chair in her bedroom, both dogs in her lap, still dressed in her workout clothes, wanting to cry again. She'd seduced a married man with a pretty wife and kids who rode in car seats and sang about the wheels on the bus. Pulling joy and luck close to her, she thought miserably, I'm a homewrecker. The idea went against nearly everything Justine stood for, and yet there it was, hovering about like a ghost, trying to get her to break down, to succumb to the weight of what she'd done with Paul, and of the attack in Mexico. She was suffering, but it didn't mitigate things, she thought fiercely. A diagnosis of PTSD would not change what she had done, who she was, what she had become. Justine's next thought was that she had to write things somehow, atone for her sins. Should she go to Paul's wife and confess? But what good would that do? She'd scar the poor woman and destroy their marriage. The truth was, Justine had been the aggressor. She had encouraged the tension that had been building with Paul, knowing nearly nothing about the man, not even his last name. It was true that he'd allowed himself to be seduced and asked her out for coffee the day before, but it was all so confusing. She didn't know what to do. Then she did. She called up Ellen Hayes, a fellow psychologist she admired, got put through. Justine, Hayes said. So good to hear from you. It's been too long, Ellen, Justine allowed. But I'm looking for a recommendation for a therapist who specializes in the aftermath of trauma. That would be you, dear. The referral is for me, Ellen. Silence, and then... Are you all right? Physically, yes, Justine said. The rest I'm trying to figure out. Then you'll come see me. Hayes insisted. I can fit you in... How about tomorrow afternoon? Four. Perfect. And thanks, Justine said, and hung up. She went into the shower, stood there under the beating hot water, trying to take hope from the fact that she'd soon be able to talk to someone about what had been going on in her life. In the meantime, she told herself she had to have some purpose for the rest of her day, or she'd surely drive herself guilty, bitter, and quite possibly crazy. Drying off, Justine forced herself to make a list of options. She could return to Guadalajara, find Adelita Gomez, 
figure out her relationship to Captain Gomez, if any. But that idea made her almost breathless, and she realized she feared Captain Gomez almost as much as she did Carla, the big woman in the jail cell. That left for today, anyway, the Harlow's charity, sharing hands. After drying her hair and dressing in yoga pants and a USC Trojan's sweatshirt, Justine got her laptop, sat on the floor in her living room, and called up the Sharing Hands website. Tom and Jennifer Harlow dominated the charity's homepage, heads touching, hands clasped, shooting the camera fetching looks, as if they'd been interrupted in a moment of deep intimacy but were still darn happy to see you. Indeed, at first glance, Justine had trouble understanding that this was actually a website for an organization that benefited orphans. But then she saw that in the background of that photograph of the Harlows, there was a jungle landscape with a clearing and a bright white school building. Reading through the rest of the site, which showed orphanages being built and happy children gathering around one or both Harlows, Justine was struck by the scope of what they were trying to do, how many children they were trying to help, and the gentle, respectful request for money to fund that vision that appeared on every page. Help our hands share. And a PayPal button. They made it that easy. Justine decided to check the California Attorney General's site for any complaints about the charity, and found none. She consulted several online charity watchdogs. Sharing Hands received exemplary reviews for transparency and innovation, as well as gushing praise for the actor's involvement. Several reviews also noted the Harlow's decision to keep back 50% of all raised money to build an endowment for the non-profit, much the way universities do to ensure that scholarships and other good works continue far into the... A tremendous crashing noise out in the street in front of her house tore her away from the computer. Joy and luck went nuts, racing across the living room and up onto the couch below the front window, howling and barking. Justine got up, looked out through the blinds, and saw Jack's Tuareg smashed into the side of a black Trans Am. Jack was holding a gun on a man who was obviously bleeding to death. Chapter 91 My Irish luck that two of my favorite LAPD detectives were sent to investigate what happened in front of Justine's house. Lieutenant Mitch Tandy and Detective Len Ziegler were the same duo who had attempted to railroad me for my old girlfriend's murder. I kept things professional, answered every question straight, told them I'd been with the mayor and Chief Fesco that morning, that I'd driven to Justine's to check on her, and what had happened during the attack. He said he was hired? asked Lieutenant Tandy, a tough little guy in love with tanning beds. He said it was a job, I replied. I asked who hired him. He died. We were standing in Justine's driveway. She stood off to the side, holding joy and luck on leashes, taking in the swarm of crime scene investigators and patrol officers who'd taken over her neighborhood. Convenient he croaks like that, said Detective Ziegler, a former swimmer gone to pot, with big shoulders and a Milwaukee tumor where his waistline should have been. He looked more and more like a walrus every time I saw him. For who? I asked already knowing where this was leading. You, said Ziegler, who also seemed to approach everything in life through the prism of conspiracy theories that crystallized out of his head in all sorts of illogical shapes and sizes. You know, Len, for once, I agree with you, I said. It was extremely convenient for me that he died and I didn't. Sorry if I don't apologize for that. Tandy gave a flick of his hand, calling off the conspiracy walrus. Any idea who'd want you dead, Jack? I was unnerved to come up with multiple possibilities. Carmine Nochia, no prisoners, whoever took the Harlows, and my own brother among them. But what good would telling these guys do? I'd just be asking them to stick their nose in affairs I'd rather keep quiet. No, I said at last. I've been doing nothing lately but spreading good cheer and doing good deeds. Ask anyone. Right, Ziegler said. You're a regular Tom Harlow. I ignored him, talked to Tandy. You'll tell me who he is? I think you know who he is, Ziegler said. I did, actually. I'd searched the car and found a wallet and ID. Vladimir Karanov, 37, resident alien, currently living in Brighton Beach, New York. The car was registered in New York as well. I'd taken photos of all his documents and returned them before the police arrived. 
Looking at Ziegler placidly, I said, And I think you know, I know who he is. What? Ziegler said, confused. I'm walking away now, I said. You're sworn to uphold the law, so go find whoever tried to kill me. I went toward Justine and the dogs. We hadn't had time to say much to each other since she'd called 911. Want some coffee? She asked, looking anxious, sad, and wan in a way I'd never seen before. I'd love some. Inside the bungalow, she had the blinds drawn, but the windows behind them were open, and you could hear the vague rumor of the ongoing crime scene investigation. Every once in a while, one or the other of the dogs would start growling at the noise, and Justine would hush her. My mind was clanging, and my hand was trembling at the memories of the attack. If I hadn't gotten my foot on the pedal, who knows? Justine came over, poured me coffee. I studied her as a way to escape my own thoughts, and as she turned, it struck me that she was carrying some heavy burden, her not-so-perfect lover. You all right? I asked. She nodded. Just a little green around the gills. I'm not used to drinking that much on an empty stomach. I said nothing as she sat on the opposite side of the kitchen counter, stirring her coffee and finding it terribly interesting. How do you deal with it? She asked at last. What are we talking about? Violence, she said. You seem at ease during times of violence. I wouldn't say at ease, I replied. I was just taught to be resourceful when things get chaotic. You either have the capacity for it or you don't, I suppose, she said. What's this all? She shook her head. We've got more important things on our plate. I've been looking into sharing hands. I still wanted to know what was going on with her, but I could tell she was in no mood to go there. So I said, The orphan's charity? Yes, she said. It's quite a remarkable operation. Justine showed me the Sharing Hands website, summarized the reviews the organization had received from various philanthropy watchdogs that cited the Harlow's commitment and the charity's foresight in building an endowment. Makes them sound like saints, I said. It does, Justine said. Then again, how many family values congressmen get caught with mistresses? More than a few. Let's keep digging. We scrolled through a dozen or more references to Sharing Hands' good deeds before spotting an aberration in the comments section below an article about the charity that had run in the London Times two months before. The comment was signed, A. Abu Bakar. Mr. Abu Bakar claimed to be from Nigeria. They promised us an orphanage and a school, Abu Bakar wrote. They say they have built several in my country, but ignore the Harlow's glamour. Come here and look for yourself. There are none that I can find. Justine said, He's probably just a kook, don't you think? The rest of the testimonials we'd looked at had been so uniformly full of praise that I was about to agree with her. But then I noticed something that had been staring us in the face all along. Doors began to open in my mind, and through them I saw dimensions we'd never considered before when it came to Tom and Jennifer Harlow. What? Justine said, seeing something in my expression. You believe him? We have a bunch of things to check out before I'll say that, I replied. And then we're going to have a face-to-face -face chat with the friendly crew over at Harlow Quinn. Chapter 92 Dave Sanders lived in Brentwood in a sprawling Georgian manor surrounded by a high wall and a gate that faced North Carmelina Avenue. Driving one of the company suburbans now that my Tuareg was totaled, I pulled up to the gate around 7.30 that night, about 40 minutes after the kid alerted us that Sanders had returned home and, surprise, was entertaining this evening. His guests? Camilla Bronson and Terry Graves. I hit the buzzer by the gate, looked up at the camera. After several moments, Sanders answered gruffly. What do you want, Morgan? I've got the Harlow's staff from the ranch with me, I said. They'd like to see the children. Impossible, he snapped. What business do you... I've got a writ here, I said, cutting him off and waving a piece of paper out the window. Signed by Judge Maxwell, ordering you to allow them to see the Harlow children. If you do not open this gate, I will call LAPD and they will see the order carried out. For several seconds, Sanders said nothing. Then, I don't know what you're up to, Jack, but fair warning, I don't trust you. Feelings mutual, Dave, 
I said brightly. Now open the gate. A pause, then a loud click, and the steel gates swung back. We drove onto a lighted drive that split before a long, narrow reflecting pool that finished in a fountain in front of the house. Wasn't this place in the Beverly Hillbillies? I asked Justine as I took the right fork in the drive. She looked at me quizzically. Sorry, that show was a bit before my time. Mine too. But watch it sometime, I replied. A classic. I really think this might be the place where Jethro and Miss Hathaway did their funny business. She looked at me like I was nuts, and then laughed. It was good to see her smile again. We parked out front where the cement drive gave way to a mosaic of inlaid stone. We got out, opened the back doors, released Anita Fontana, Maria Toro, and Jacinta Feliz, who turned nervous and submissive when Sanders opened the massive front door and came out under the portico, followed by Camilla Bronson and Terry Graves. Where's this writ? Sanders demanded. I handed it to him winked at the publicist and the producer, said, Amazing how swiftly judges react when the FBI's special agent in charge requests something. And you'll see that Justine Smith is named as court-appointed supervisor of this and future visits. For once, Camilla Bronson was at a loss for words. Terry Graves acted as if we were unpleasant bugs come to call. Sanders read the writ closely, looking for loopholes, I suppose. But the document was ironclad. He handed it back to me, sniffed. You could have called and made an appointment. And miss breaking bread with the Harlow Quinn team? I said, not a chance. But first, the kids. The Harlow's attorney nodded stiffly toward the door. The housekeeper, the cook, and the maid went by him quickly into a large marble foyer with a sweeping staircase that rose to a second floor. I came in last, nodded, said, in the old Beverly Hillbillies show, didn't Jed Clampett live here, in this house? Sanders looked insulted. He most certainly did not. Striking resemblance. In a deepening huff, the attorney led us off the foyer to a screening room where the children were watching a movie about a tailless dolphin. Miguel! Anita cried. The boy looked over the seat at her, acted as if he'd expected never to see her again. Nita! He yelled and ran into her arms. The Harlow's housekeeper fell to her knees and embraced the boy, tears streaming down her face, as she kissed him and spoke to him in Spanish, calling him her little one and her best boy. Pressing her shiny cheeks to his, she looked radiant and complete in an unexpected way, as if the two were deep soulmates. Malia and Jin were on their feet, hugging Maria Toro and Jacinta Feliz, who'd also broken into tears. Look how big you get, the cook said to Malia, who towered over her. You good? Jacinta asked Jin. Jin glanced at Sanders, bit her lower lip, but nodded. They're being well cared for, Camilla Bronson declared. Dave's hired round-the-clock help, Terry Graves said. Cook, maid, tutors, psychologists, Sanders added. Even a physical fitness instructor. And we got a Wii and a Nintendo installed, isn't that right? Malia shrugged and then bobbed her head. But he won't let us go out, Nita, Miguel complained to the housekeeper. He won't let us watch TV hardly ever. He won't tell us what happened to Tom and Jen, and he keeps Stella in a kennel all the time. Sanders gave a sickly smile to the boy, then to me and Justine, and said, The dog's been peeing everywhere. And I advise that the children not be seen in public, Camilla Bronson said. We're trying to protect them from the howling mob, Terry Graves said. I'm sure you are, I said. But who's here to protect them from you three? Sanders acted as if I'd slapped him, sputtered, How dare you insinuate that anything untoward has ever... We're fine, Malia said to Justine. No one's hurt us or anything. Jim nodded, but her brother's head was bowed. Sanders's chin rose and he gazed at us in triumph. Jack? the publicist said. You don't really need to be here, do you? I winked at her a second time. Why don't you go get the dog so the kids can play with her, and then the five of us will have a little chat. About what? Terry Graves asked icily. Come on, I said. You sound like someone who likes to know the end of a movie before you've even seen it. Chapter 93 after bringing Stella to the screening room, 
where the bulldog was greeted like Cleopatra returning to Luxor, Sanders reluctantly led us into his private library, a polished, meticulous man cave done up like an alpine lodge, Oxford red leather club chairs and couch, a poster-sized photograph of the attorney skiing at Aspen when he was younger, his framed degrees from USC and Bolt Hall, and a massive flat-screen television above the gas fireplace where the moose head should have been. What's this all about? demanded Sanders, who was flanked by Camilla Bronson and Terry Graves, both of whom were regarding Justine and me as if we were ferrets or some other kind of blood-seeking weasel. I took one of the club chairs while they remained standing, said, We think we've made a break in the Harlow case, several, in fact. Their expressions mutated through a variety of emotions, surprise, skepticism, and wariness, all in a matter of two seconds. What? Camilla Bronson began before Sanders cut her off. You were fired, Jack. Absolutely, Terry Graves said. Whatever you've turned up, don't expect to be paid for it. Wouldn't dream of that, I said, marveling at the way the man's brain worked. But you should know that people who work at private are suckers for lost causes. We also have a deep aversion for jobs left unfinished. The producer's eyes darted to Justine and back. What have you found? That the three of you are colossal liars, I said, speeding up before any of them could protest. We can't figure out exactly why yet. But we're close, Justine said. Get out, Sanders said hotly. Take the help with you. Time's up. I didn't move, said as firmly as I would to one of Justine's terriers. Sit down, the three of you, or I will make a call to the FBI that will turn your world so fucking far upside down and confining. It will take a Houdini act on your part to get any of it right again. They watched me for a long beat, trying to see if I was bluffing. Then, one by one, and more contritely, they took seats. Camilla Bronson cleared her throat, said, What is it you think we've lied to you about? All sorts of things, Justine said. Sanders scowled. I said, But we'll limit the discussion at present to the Harlow's finances. That got their attention. What about them? You told us, Dave, that they were on the verge of bankruptcy, I said. Nothing could be further from the truth. Isn't that right? No, it's not right, he snapped. They were spending far beyond their means, and they were in danger of personal bankruptcy. Chapter 7. I saw the nuance. But not corporate bankruptcy. Chapter 11. He studied me. They were on more solid ground there. Why? I asked. Because Tom got the cash from the mysterious investor you told us about? That's right, he said, sounding like he was on sure ground himself. Or should I say Harlow Quinn got the money, I said, looking at Terry Graves. Is that right? The producer hesitated, but then nodded. Yes, it was a good thing. No doubt, Justine said agreeably. So who is Mr. Mysterious Deep Pockets? Sanders rolled his palms outward. As I'm sure you understand, this kind of investor prefers to remain anonymous, and we can't breach the attorney-client and fiduciary privileges. Terry Graves almost smiled, but Camilla Bronson was scratching her right forearm. It was the first unpolished thing I'd ever seen her do. Lying again, I snapped. You three are pathological. What did that come from? A genetic defect? A rotten childhood? Or did you all study hard to be lying asses? As one, their faces reddened and twisted in anger. Sanders struggled to stand. The publicist did too, saying, I'm not listening to... Justine said, We know that ESH Limited is the deep pockets. Nicely done, by the way, I said. The offshore company, the Panamanian bank, just enough distance that you could claim the money came from a mysterious investor. Sanders's face had looked ready to explode, but now he sank into his chair. Camilla Bronson followed, scratching at her forearm again. Terry Graves had paled considerably. How could you know about ESH? We're good, I said. It's why you hired us. Breaking the registering agent's will only cost me twenty grand. Tom and Jennifer own ESH Limited. Sanders said quickly, So what? We use ESH to receive and hold monies earned overseas. There's absolutely nothing illegal. 
Then why lie? Justine asked. I made a tisk-tisk gesture with my finger. Let's just get it out on the table, shall we? No more beating about the whatever. ESH is indeed where the Harlows gather overseas money to be funneled into Harlow Quinn Productions, but the money is not from foreign film proceeds. Or not so much, anyway. Not one of them responded. I went on, enjoying myself, saying, That's what we thought ESH was all about when we first learned of its existence. But earlier today we figured out that ESH really stands for Endowment Sharing Hands. The fund boasted about ad nauseum on the so-called charity's website. So-called charity, Camilla Bronson said fiercely. That foundation has saved hundreds, thousands of lives. Probably, Justine said. But think how many more kids could have been saved if the $27 million the Harlows siphoned away to fund their for-profit movie business had actually been spent on orphans. Siphoned, Terry Graves cried. It's not like that at all. Sure it is, I replied. Did you know that Private has done a lot of work with PayPal the last few years? Lots and lots of goodwill there. PayPal, the producer said, confused. So what? Justine said. You jiggered the PayPal account associated with sharing hands so that 50% of every dollar was diverted and deposited in ESH Limited's Panamanian bank account. Brilliantly conceived, I said. A secret piggy bank that just keeps filling for little piggies like you, Dave. And you, Camilla and Terry. Not to mention Tom and Jennifer, Justine said. It's not like that at all, Sanders protested. There are promissory notes and detailed contracts, agreements. Those funds were an investment for sharing hands. The charity stands to make back its money fivefold when Saigon Falls hits. Incredulous, I said. But you've got interlocking boards of directors between the charity, an offshore legal entity, and a production company designed to make its owners multi-million dollar profits? That's collusion any way you look at it, Counselor. And the way I look at it, when this comes to light, you will all be put in prison, punished, and publicly vilified for taking money from orphans to make a goddamned movie, no matter how brilliant it might be. Chapter 94 The Harlow Quinn team sat there, looking at us in stunned silence. It was the kind of moment where someone might lose it and go for a weapon. My right hand moved slowly to my pistol. But instead of running amok, Sanders gave a shudder and his shoulders trembled. His eyes watered, his face twisted in open despair as he choked. I tried to rein them in, Camilla Bronson panicked. Shut up, Dave! Fuck you, Camilla, said Terry Graves, then looked at me, trying to project earnestness. Dave and I both tried to keep Tom from chasing every grandiose dream that came into his unbefucking leavably creative genius brain. He threw up his hands to an invisible audience. I couldn't stand up to Tom when it came to spending. You two are making a monstrous mistake, the publicist warned. The attorney ignored her. And I couldn't stop Jennifer from spending like a freak in their personal life. A fucking OCD spending freak, Terry Graves said. Tom would come in, all explosive energy, manic with it. And he'd make you see his visions. And then later, in the theater, he'd show you far beyond what he caused you to imagine in the first place. Right up there, 30 feet high on the screen, like he was some kind of super magician. Or God. The way he looked at life and his stories, they made you want to laugh, to cheer, and to cry, didn't they? Tom could make you endure deep tragedy and know the far reaches of love and humanity. He shook his head, now gazing at Justine in bewilderment. How do you deal with someone who can do all that? I reappraised him but said nothing, leaving Justine to ask, What really happened to Tom and Jennifer Harlow? We don't know, Camilla Bronson said, tears forming in her eyes. We honestly don't. And all I can think is that it's a tragedy that the world might never see Saigon Falls, never see their final, incredible vision. Save that crap for a retrospective in Entertainment Weekly, I said. Tell us about Adelita Gomez. Adelita, Sanders said. 
Terry Graves blinked. What about her? She's from Guadalajara, Justine replied, which is where a blogger was murdered recently after posting that Jennifer and Tom had been seen in that city after their disappearance, highly intoxicated or on drugs. I saw that, the publicist said as if she'd chewed something bitter. National Enquirer nonsense. Maybe not, I said. Again, tell us about Adelita. She was the nanny, the attorney said. She went to Vietnam with them, which is where I met her briefly twice during my trips over there. Terry Graves was studying his hands. They loved her. Tom and Jennifer gave her a small role in the film. Why? Camilla Bronson said. Where is Adelita? What is she saying? We have no idea where she is or what she's saying, I replied. Cynthia Maines told us Adelita left Saigon two days before the Harlows, bound for Mexico on a vacation. There you are, then, Sanders said. Don't you think it's strange she hasn't contacted someone about the Harlows? It's international news. I don't know what to tell you, he said, and I believed him. Then tell us about the cameras in the panic room above the Harlows' bedroom, Justine said. All three of them squinted at her. What? Terry Graves asked. She told them what she'd found. They listened, openly confused. You didn't know they had a panic room? I asked when she finished. I had only a vague idea they did, Sanders said. The producer said, I've never seen it, but Tom said it was installed when Sandy Shine owned the place. Maybe Sandy put those brackets there. He was a professional degenerate, you know. Sandy Shine was a hyper-mercurial actor who'd been nominated for an Oscar at 16, only to turn wild in his 20s. Drugs, alcohol, and a long series of scandals, rehabs, and tawdry affairs that somehow transformed him into a comedic superstar with his own top-rated television show. We'll check it out, I said, stood, and motioned to Justine that we were leaving. What are you going to do with all this information? Camilla Bronson asked. We haven't decided yet, I replied. The attorney rubbed his hands together and said in a beseeching tone, What can we do? How can we help you? Terry Graves picked up on his angle, said, That's right. What can we change so this isn't made public? I thought about that. Justine beat me to it. How about you start by firing the cook and maid you hired and bringing in the Harlow's help in their place? The children love them. It will help stabilize them. It's what I would tell a court. Of course, Sanders babbled as if he were suddenly our fawning servant. The trio followed us out of the man cave back down the hall toward the screening room. I should have thought of that before. We should have thought about that, echoed Terry Graves. But none of us ever had children, you know, said Camilla Bronson. Why didn't that surprise me? In any case, I tuned out their blather, turned the corner, glanced into the screening room, and saw the Harlow children and the Harlow help. Miguel sat in Anita's lap. The others were on the floor, giving the bulldog a belly rub. Justine gasped beside me. I startled, looked at her. She was staring into the screening room, watching them, her lips parted in wonder. What? I asked. Justine tore her attention away, looked at me, deeply puzzled but then shook her head and said, Nothing. I just thought I saw something I hadn't... But it's nothing, I'm sure. Chapter 95 Justine would not elaborate on what she'd been thinking back in Sanders' mansion as she looked at the Harlow children and their beloved servants. Indeed, she didn't seem to want to talk about anything at all on the ride back to her bungalow. She just stared out at L.A. blipping by as if it were some foreign country she was reluctantly visiting for the first time. The crime scene investigators were gone when we reached her street, though the chalk mark that had surrounded the assassin's body was still there, along with the blood that darkened the pavement. Talk in the morning? I asked when Justine reached for the door handle. She nodded, hesitated, looked at me. Last night, when you brought me home and I was drunk, I was completely honorable. No, of course. Nothing like... Did I say anything... strange? Not me? My eyes never left hers as I shook my head. Justine, 
I don't remember anything strange or not you at all. You were tired. You drank a little too much. In our business, it happens. She softened. You are a good person, Jack. I try to be, I said. Need me to walk you to the door? No, she said. The dogs are there. I'll be fine. I watched her until she'd opened her door, the Jack Russells jumping around her. She looked back at me and waved. Putting the Suburban in reverse, I was suddenly exhausted. I'd survived a murder attempt and helped uncover fraud on a massive scale. I deserved a good night's sleep. As I drove home, I put in a call to Mobot, asked her how the coding party was coming along. The money's going to be transferred from the California General Fund account, she said. We just got word of that a few minutes ago, and we're making some last-minute changes so the tick hides deep in the file's metadata. If you say so, I replied. They're the best, right? The fine ladies of Cal Poly? Maureen said as if it were heresy to even question their qualifications. They've thought of a ridiculous number of things Cy and I missed. Enough said. We'll talk in the morning. I'll explain what ESH Limited is. Look forward to it, she said, hung up. I reached my house. It was cool outside. The sea breeze was building. I went inside, turned on the gas fireplace. I sprawled on the couch, watching the flames. I thought of the last time I'd watched the fire. I thought of Gwen Scott Evans and wondered when the actress was returning from London. Then Justine elbowed her way back into my thoughts. Justine had always been the level head in the room, or at least it had always seemed that way to me. And she'd always been the one to try to get me to open up. Now she seemed to be retreating into herself. Why? I got a Sam Adams from the fridge, drank it while munching on a bag of microwave popcorn trying unsuccessfully to figure out what was beating her up so badly. I finally decided she'd tell me in her own time, if that was what she decided. If not, I'd give her the space to try and work it through. After getting a second Sam, I turned on the television, tried to watch the Lakers-Bulls game. But it was preseason stuff and none of the plays looked crisp, and I quickly got bored. Passing on a perfect chance to catch up on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, I instead turned the TV off, listened to the silence of my house, and went back to watching the fake fire in my hearth. Someone had tried to kill me. Someone had sent an assassin to take me out. Who? Why? Earlier in the day I'd come up with several likely suspects, and lying there on the couch, I tried to go through them one by one. Front and center, Carmine Nochia. He had outright accused me of tipping the DEA to the hijacked shipment of painkillers. I'd outbluffed him when he and Tommy had tried to extort me out of private. No doubt about it, Carmine had cause. Two, Tommy. I wanted desperately to say impossible, but he was ruthless and mean, and more than a little fucked up in too many ways to count. He might try to leverage me in ways I hadn't considered. He'd pretend that he'd implicate me in murder. But would he? He'd certainly screw me over if he could, and had succeeded at that more than once. But in the end, I was his brother, right? There was a line somewhere that he wouldn't cross, right? He wouldn't personally hire a Russian assassin, would he? Or was I just a hopeless romantic when it came to what my brother might have been? Three. No prisoners? Possibly. But why would they key on me? I hadn't exactly been front and center on that case. LAPD and LA sheriffs had helped me in that respect, putting their own people in front of the cameras. Four. Members of the Harlow Quinn team? Had one of them threatened to blow the story on the Orphans Fund? Or had the actors been ignorant of the way the money was being funneled to the Saigon Falls project, then discovered it? And had they been preparing to go to the authorities? Five. Whoever took the Harlows, excluding the Harlow Quinn team. I suppose that was possible. Maybe we were close and someone had decided to take me out. Then again, for the most part, Justine had taken the lead in that investigation. Had she been the assassin's real target, with me a lucky opportunity? It was suddenly all too much to think about. My head ached and I closed my eyes. I honestly don't remember falling asleep.
Chapter 96 My cell phone rang and I jerked alert on my couch, head, groggy. What time was it? 3.30 a.m. I'd been sleeping five hours. Yawning, I picked up the cell, saw a number I didn't recognize, answered. This better be good. Didn't want to come tell me in person that someone tried to kill you, huh? I hung my head, feeling guilty for having forgotten to visit Del Rio, or at least call him. It was a crazy day, Rick, I began. I'm sure it was, he said. Make up for it. Get over here ASAP. It's 3.30 in the morning. There's someone here wants to see you, misses you deeply. I flashed on Angela, the Filipina nurse. It's 3.30 in the morning. Which is why you better get your ass over here, Jack, Del Rio said firmly. Ghosts like the one standing in front of me need to be gone and well hidden in spooky spook land long before sunrise. Chapter 97 I hadn't seen him in more than a decade, but he had not aged a bit and still looked like an overgrown choir boy with pale pinkish skin, a pleasant pie-shaped face, and a riot of curly orange hair. But the eyes gave the lie to everything else, hard and dark as sapphires, even if his lips were smiling. Guy Carpenter, I said when I saw him in the chair usually reserved for me in Del Rio's hospital room. Carpenter was dressed in boat shoes, khakis, a white polo shirt, and a blue windbreaker sporting the logo of a country club in Chevy Chase, Maryland. With the titleist ball cap on his head, he looked ready for thirty-six holes. I knew better. He'd never been in a country club in his life, unless it was one constructed especially for badasses, which he most definitely was. Jack Morgan, Carpenter said, getting to his feet, shooting me a winning smile, and shaking my hand while those hard, sapphire eyes danced over me, making me feel oddly expendable. Been following your career since the Stan. Can't say the same about you. Yeah, well, I was always better suited to the shadows than you were. How long did you last at the company? Two years, I said. Difference of philosophy. I figured that, he replied, then laughed and shook his head. Isn't it strange the way life unfolds? The unexpected turns and twists? Del Rio spoke up from the bed. You come here to tell us something, guy, or get all touchy-feely about life unfolding in its grand arc? He hasn't changed, Carpenter said to me, throwing a thumb Del Rio's way. Even with a broken back, he hasn't changed. Not a bit, I replied. Carpenter's smiling face fell then, and I saw the darkness I'd glimpsed several times in Afghanistan when Del Rio and I were charged with moving him about the country on missions we never fully understood. He went to the door and shut it, then jammed a chair under the doorknob. That nurse is a real pain, he said. I figured she might try to interrupt our business just to get her jollies. You were always a quick study, I said. Dartmouth will do that for you. Carpenter replied before looking at Del Rio. Those fingerprints you sent me? Yes. They don't exist. And that's why you flew three thousand miles to see me? Del Rio asked. I heard your back was broken. Bullshit, Del Rio said. Whatever, Carpenter replied, his face hardening. Those fingerprints belong to no one, and because the three of us go way back— I thought you'd want to hear me say that in person. Take it as a warning if you want, but don't try to find someone who doesn't exist. Wait, I said. Warning from who? People with far more reach than I've got, Carpenter said. Spooky, spooky spook people. Did Rick tell you where the fingerprints came from? I asked. As a matter of fact, no, he replied. But it doesn't matter. Oh, but it does. I said. I told him everything, described seeing the four dead bodies on Malibu Beach, the killings in the CVS, and the explosion on the Huntington Beach Pier. Then I described how a drag queen shooter playing Marilyn Monroe on skates killed six at Mel's drive-in before a granny who would have been the seventh shot him dead. This is our first serious clue as to who is behind no prisoners, I said. We need your help, 
or eight will die tomorrow. Through all of it, Carpenter had listened impassively, as if he were hearing the plot of a new action movie and not the gruesome details of an actual mass murder spree. When I was done, he blinked several times, rubbed his fair cheeks, and pursed his lips. I read about some of this, he said. No prisoners? That's the handle, Del Rio said. You recognize it? Carpenter shook his head. But you know those fingerprints, I said. Otherwise, I don't see you coming here at all, as compassionate a man as you are. And I don't think that warning was coming from any triple spooky people. I think it's coming from you. Carpenter thought that was funny, but said, No one ever said you were a dummy, Jack. But from me or whoever, take it as fair warning. Del Rio said, There are twenty-one people dead, innocent people. Eight more may die. Women, children. Doesn't that kind of thing get through to you? Or are you so jaded by your life in the shadows that nothing gets through anymore? To my surprise, Carpenter's face cracked and the hard bravado fled, and he honestly seemed to age right in front of me, his eyes hollowing and his cheeks sagging. He said in a weary voice, These kinds of things get to me more than you could ever imagine, Rick. The things I've seen, the stuff I know, I haven't slept right in years. High time to get some of it off your chest, I replied. Either that, or the twenty-one people dead here in L.A. are going to become a permanent part of your nightmares and obsessions. Carpenter's shoulders hunched, and he gazed at me as if I were Jacob Marley's ghost, showing him the length and weight of an invisible chain that threatened to hang from him for all eternity. I don't want that, he said quietly. Then tell us what you know, Del Rio said. Help us stop these killings. Chapter 98 Carpenter looked at the floor a long time, as if seeing something on the antiseptic film that coated the hospital tiles. Okay, he said at last, but none of this can become public, and none of this can ever be traced to me. If you attribute the information to me, well, we get it. I replied. Far as I'm concerned, you were some mirage I once hallucinated in Afghanistan. Del Rio nodded. You've got our word. Carpenter sighed, slouched in the recliner, and for the next hour and a half, and on past sunrise, told us a story that we never would have believed if Del Rio and I hadn't been in Afghanistan ourselves during the crazy times after the invasion, after bin Laden's escape from the Tora Bora cave system during the beginnings of the Neo-Taliban counterinsurgency, long before the surge. Carpenter said the fingerprints belonged to Clive Johnson, Master Sergeant Clive Johnson, who'd served in the Rangers and then with several Joint Special Operations Command teams, which drew elite warriors from all four branches of the military. It was early 2003, and the forces we'd committed to Afghanistan were being drawn down sent to stage up in Kuwait before the invasion of Iraq, Carpenter said. There was a lot of dissension in the ranks, especially among spec ops who'd been in country since November 2001, right from the beginning. I remembered. They felt they were being undercut, forgotten. Carpenter nodded. They were being given all sorts of conflicting signals regarding the rules of engagement, when you could shoot, who you could shoot that kind of thing. Del Rio nodded. All sorts of good men died because of that. Hell, that was still going on two years later when SEAL Team 10 turned into the lone survivor because they wouldn't kill the kid who betrayed them to the Taliban. Carpenter nodded. That was just the worst of it. But back in 2003, frustration among the special forces hit another, earlier high point these elite soldiers were asking themselves whether they were in Afghanistan to fight and beat the Taliban, or merely to offer al-Qaeda easy access to walking, talking American targets. Indeed, those questions echoed high into the U.S. chain of command in Kabul. An army general, who shall remain nameless, decided that enough was enough, Carpenter said. 
he decided on his own to detach a new secret JSOC team out of Kandahar. Their job was simple, to disrupt the trade in raw opium and black tar heroin that was funding the Taliban insurgency in the mountains along the Pakistani border, by any means necessary. Johnson was a member of that JSOC team? Del Rio asked. Handpicked by the Marine Recon Commander, the General chose to lead the secret team. Carpenter got a tablet computer from a backpack I hadn't noticed and called up a grainy snapshot of a man in his early forties. The left side of his face was covered in scars, and he gave off the distinct impression that he could eat broken glass and like it. Meet Lee Cobb, one bad dude, Carpenter said, looking old again. He got the scars in the first Gulf War, landmine, shook it off, healed up, went right back at it. Remember when you took me on that night drop-off, spring of 04? Snowstorm, I asked. Zabul province? That's the one, Carpenter said, west of Khalid. I remembered it. Brutal terrain. Hardcore Taliban country. Thinking back on how stranger than normal Carpenter had seemed that night. I said, you were going to meet up with Cobb and his team? More like try to stop them before they committed any more atrocities, Carpenter said in a hollow voice. Chapter 99 From early March 2003 through April 2006, while the world's attention was largely focused on the invasion of Iraq, the chaotic aftermath of the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, and the rise of the radical Shiite cleric Muqtada al-Sadr, Cobb's team ran ad hoc missions in some of the most dangerous country in Afghanistan. At first, Cobb and his men stuck to the general's playbook, Carpenter said. They worked to break up networks developing between poppy growers and Taliban fighters demanding tribute from the heroin manufacturers. In return for security, the growers paid the Taliban who used the cash to fund their war. At first, Del Rio said. At first, Carpenter replied. Spring of 2004, things slipped off the rails while Cobb and his men were on a mission northwest of Tarankot. The general had a heart attack and died, having destroyed virtually all records regarding the secret JSOC team. They were, shall we say, left to their own devices. I don't follow, I said. They became a ghost team, Carpenter said. They didn't exist, so they were never extracted. Left out there, in country. Until you went in after them? Del Rio asked. I was the third to try to bring them in, Carpenter said. He said that in the summer of 2004, U.S. Defense Intelligence began getting reports of a rogue unit operating in the rugged massif north of Kandahar. Cobb and his men were said to be turning the tables on the Taliban, demanding their own tribute from the poppy growers, and executing anyone or anything suspected of supporting al-Qaeda and the insurgency. Men, women, children, dogs, horses, Carpenter said quietly. You name it, they killed it if their demands weren't met. So Cobb kind of went Colonel Kurtz, I asked. You could say he found his own way to the heart of darkness, Carpenter agreed. You could also say that he led a thirteen-month reign of terror that, quite frankly, worked. How so? Del Rio asked. The Taliban lost ground or died out everywhere Cobb's team went, Carpenter replied. Poppy growers paid up or died, too. And there was ample evidence that Cobb and his men amassed a small fortune in gold and black tar heroin that they managed to stash across the border in Pakistan. By late fall of 2004, the evidence of a secret JSOC team was overwhelming. Two senior CIA Special Activities Division, or SAD, operators were sent in to convince Cobb to come out of the hills and report his activities. We lost contact with both men, and they were and are presumed dead, Carpenter said. You two flew me into their area when the snow started thawing in the spring of 05. That sounded right, and I nodded.
Carpenter said it took him two weeks to find Cobb's team, but he did, living in a box canyon deep in the mountains. He delivered an ultimatum. Cobb and his men could continue their lawless activities, be branded renegades, hunted, captured, court-martialed, and sent to Leavenworth for execution. Or, Del Rio asked, or they could leave the mountains with me, quietly, without anyone knowing, Carpenter said. And in return, Carpenter cleared his throat. They got immunity for their actions. They took the deal? Del Rio asked. Carpenter nodded. You two had crashed in the meantime, so you weren't the ones to extract us. I brought Cobb's team back to Kabul, where they were debriefed about their activities. The intelligence officers were horrified by what they learned. But Cobb and his men had immunity, and no legal action could be taken. Illegal action was something else again. What do you mean? I asked. Carpenter pinched the bridge of his nose. The way I heard it, secretly and at the highest levels of the U.S. military and intelligence apparatus, a decision was made to punish Cobb's team, to turn them into pariahs. How? Oh. By making them what they had become in Afghanistan, a team of savages that no longer existed, Carpenter said. Literally over the course of two days, the records of all six men were permanently expunged from all government databases. Their money was seized, their bank accounts erased, their pensions were nullified and evaporated, all credit lines vanished as well. Their next of kin were notified of their deaths in combat, given generous bulk death payments and weighted coffins to bury. Then, Cobb and his men were flown back into the mountains north of Kandahar and dumped, weaponless, deep inside Taliban-controlled country. Until you sent that set of fingerprints to me, Cobb, Johnson, and the others had not been heard from since. Everyone had assumed they were long dead. Part 5 In Country Chapter 100 Are we ready, Mr. Watson? Cobb asked. He was dressed in the olive green uniform of the L.A. Standard Demolition Company. We are ready, Mr. Cobb. Watson sat hunched over the wireless keyboard, signed into an anonymous email site based in Peshawar, Pakistan. On the right-hand side of the screen, a thin rectangular box overlaid the email site. Six dozen codes were stacked in the box. Watson knew every one of them by heart. Cobb believed he was about to witness a virtuoso performance on Watson's part, the result of almost two years of work, two years of hacking his way into dozens of federal and state computer systems, learning how their digital security worked. For two years, Watson had planned the route the ten million would take out into the financial ether, breaking into pieces, moving through bank accounts and on again, splitting and transferring a total of six dozen times. Cobb allowed himself a rare smile, knowing that while the feeble law enforcement people chased the ten million they demanded, Watson would be going the other way on the digital stream, after a whole lot more. He looked around at Nickerson, Hernandez, Kelleher, men who'd walked with him out of a war zone unarmed, men who'd killed with their bare hands, men who were disciplined enough to think long-term and long-range. Ready, gentlemen? They nodded. He glanced at the clock. 9.40 a.m. Our time is now, Cobb said. Send it, Mr. Watson. Chapter 101 And we're supposed to believe the second-hand word of one man, some CIA spook we can't interrogate for ourselves? cried Sheriff Camerata after I explained to the mayor, Chief Fesco, and Special Agent Christine Townsend, who was behind the No Prisoners murder and extortion scheme. You can believe what you want, I snapped. But those prints belong to Johnson, and I believe Cobb and the rest of his team are going to be on the receiving end of ten million dollars in about ten minutes or so, whenever you get the text, Your Honor. Show them the picture, Mobot urged. Mobot stood in the background with several middle-aged women who, by their attire, 
looked more prepared for a yoga retreat than an extortion payoff. I nodded, smiled at the ladies from Cal Poly, as Mobot had been referring to them, and then typed in a command on a laptop. On the screen at the end of the conference room, up popped a grainy picture shot on a foggy spring day in the Afghan highlands. A group of battle-hardened men stood in the melting snow. That's them, I said. Cobb's far left, then Clive Johnson, Peter Kelleher, Jesus Hernandez, Denton Nickerson, and Albert Watson, who our source says is something of a genius when it comes to weapons and computers. Everyone in the room studied the picture. Cobb and his men looked either stoic or harshly amused. You'd never know they'd committed atrocities and enriched themselves in the months before Carpenter took the photograph. This is what time frame? Mayor Wills asked. April 2005, Your Honor, I said. They'll look quite a bit older now. But what do we do with this? Camerata demanded. Can we put it out there when we have no way of corroborating that this is real, that these men are the ones doing the killing? I see what you're saying, Sheriff, I said. But we're not getting any other files on these men. Other than burial records in their hometowns, they're gone. How did they survive? Fesco asked. How did they get here? We talked about that, I said. Our source's theory is that they walked out of Afghanistan along the same trails the Taliban used to bring in supplies from Pakistan. Somehow they got to their stash of gold and black tar heroin, made their way to Peshawar or some other lawless place, and bought the necessary documents. Beyond that, we have no clue. The mayor's cell phone buzzed. She stiffened, looked at it, breathed hard, said, We've got ten minutes, an account number, password, and routing code. Okay, ladies, Mobot said. You're up. Chapter 102 Doctors Esther Goldberg, Lauren Hollings, and Catherine Clarkson, the ladies of Cal Poly, were all cutting-edge computer scientists. They went quickly to their laptops, gave them instructions, and within seconds the photograph of Cobb's team disappeared and the screen split into thirds. The center third showed a secure website inside the California State Treasurer's Office. The right third displayed the Google Earth macro satellite view of the globe. The left third of the screen featured a live feed of the face of Carlton Watts, the current treasurer of the state of California. Are we ready? Watts asked. We are, Carlton, Mayor Will said, handing Esther Goldberg her cell phone so she could read the codes and routing instructions. Goldberg quickly entered the information into the secure website. Hit enter. A moment later, Watts nodded. Request is here, he hesitated, appearing worried. You're sure this tracking thingamajob will attach on the way out? As sure as I am that Einstein discovered the photoelectric effect, Goldberg said coolly. You tell him, girl, Mobot muttered. On your say, then, Watts said. I'm entering my password and the transfer authorization codes. We heard the clacking of his keyboard, then the snap of a return. The center screen hesitated, jumped. Below the California state emblem, and along with an icon that looked like a slender green tube, the figure ten million dollars appeared. The tube began to drain of green, and in less than three seconds, it was gone. On the screen to the right, Google Earth zoomed in on California, showed a line from Sacramento to Los Angeles. Got it said Lauren Hollings, staring at her screen. File and metadata are moving through our tracking software. Ticks embedding, almost ready to transfer onto that bank account. I've already got a jump on that. Tracked it through the bank identification code on the SWIFT network, said Catherine Clarkson. The money's heading to Banco Delta Asia Limited in Macau. And there she goes, said Goldberg. Up on the screen, Google Earth had retreated, showed the Pacific Rim, and another line speeding toward Macau. It was there in less than four seconds. Mayor Will said, Can we contact this bank? It's not staying there, said Goldberg. They're not that stupid. Sure enough, fifteen seconds after the ten million arrived in Macau, two lines burst on the Google Earth map and began to arc away from each other. Five million, five million, Hollings said. The first five million landed in a bank in India. The second I couldn't tell, but it looked near England. The first is in the bank of Rajasthan, New Delhi, Clarkson announced. 
second in Conister Bank, Wigan, Isle of Man. I'll be a son of a bitch, said Sheriff Camarada. It's working. What did you expect? Mobot asked with a slight sneer. Before Camarada could reply, four lines burst from those locations, each heading out in one of the four cardinal directions. But when they had traveled only a short distance on Google Earth, they hesitated, stopped, blinked, and then disappeared. Chapter 103 There were gasps from the various law enforcement officials present. Where'd it go? Mayor Wills asked. I don't. Goldberg began. I knew it, said Sheriff Camarada, spitting the words like they were tobacco juice. People began to argue among themselves. State Treasurer Watts cried, What's going on down there? Your money's gone bye-bye, Carlton, the sheriff shouted. It is not bye-bye, Goldberg shouted emphatically. They're not stupid. They found the tick and stripped it. What? Chief Fesco said. I thought... But the ladies from Cal Poly are smarter, Mobot said. Or actually, Dr. Hollings is smarter. The youngest of the computer scientists beamed. What are you talking about? Camarada demanded. She thought of putting an easy-to-spot tick on the transfer, and another virtually impossible to spot, Goldberg said with great satisfaction. Mobot poked me in the ribs with her index finger, whispered, Told you they were good. Hollings, meanwhile, had given her computer more instructions, and almost instantly the lines on the Google Earth screen ran on, dividing and moving, dividing and moving, until within no more than a minute the satellite view of Earth looked loosely strung in almost every direction. I was focusing on the dizzying complexity of the transfers, barely aware that the center third of the screen, the one still linked to the account within the California State Treasurer's office, was now blinking. We're out to 64 different accounts, Goldberg announced, and they appear to have stopped. We know where every dollar... She stopped, stared up from her laptop screen toward the large one on the wall, her mouth gaping. What's going on? The center screen showed one of those green tubes, then three, then ten. Beside each was the figure fifteen million dollars. They began to drain. What's happening? I demanded. Mobot had lost all color. Someone's looting that account. What? State Treasurer Watts yelled. On the live feed, he was frantically typing on his keyboard. No, goddammit! It won't stop! What the fuck? The tubes emptied. The screen blinked. The numbers went to zero. Holy shit, Goldberg said, her hands across her face. Watts looked like he'd been hit with a left hook. How much did they get? Mayor Wills asked in shock. Chapter 104 A hundred and fifty million! Watson crowed and slapped the table inside the garage in the City of Commerce. Cobb threw his hands in the air, then hugged Watson. Nickerson, Kelleher, and Hernandez were celebrating too, throwing high fives, doing little jigs of victory. You are a goddamn genius, Mr. Watson, Kelleher cried. Thirty million apiece, Nickerson laughed. Thirty million untraceable. I'm seeing Venezuelan women on a beach, Hernandez said, eyes closed, doing a slow dance. Watson beamed. I'll email you the various accounts where your money will land. Gentlemen, Cobb said, once again, I have to tell you what an honor it is to have served with you. Hoorah, Nickerson said. Who fucking rah? Hernandez opened his eyes, stopped dancing, and said, That mean we're cool to go now? We still need to strip this place down, pack up, Kelleher said. We're in no hurry, Cobb said. That money is far, far from here, and they have absolutely no idea where we are, or who we are. We can be gone by eight, nine at the latest. In the meantime, anyone interested in lunch? I'm starving. I could go for a burger, Hernandez admitted. Though what I'd really like is a prime New York steak. No big spending in the next few weeks, Cobb cautioned. I'll pass on the burger, start getting my gear together. Nickerson said. Double cheese with bacon with a large order of onion rings sounds like the right thing before packing up, Kelleher said. 
You three go ahead, Watson said. I want to get the account numbers to you as quickly as possible. Look for them on your phone. I'll be along right after. Cobb gazed at him for a long moment, then nodded. We'll save you a seat, he said. Outstanding job, Mr. Watson. Absolutely outstanding. Chapter 105 The governor is going to fire me for gross incompetence, moaned the state treasury secretary. A hundred and sixty million? Are you kidding? That money was just transferred in here from the franchise tax board. Mobot was white as a sheet. How did they do that? The ladies from Cal Poly looked at each other as if communicating telepathically. Then Goldberg said, The only thing we can come up with is the rest of the metadata on the file, the stuff that came from the state to us. Translate, ladies, I said, feeling more and more eyes on me. Private had assured them the ten million would be recoverable, which it still was, but a hundred and fifty million had been taken from the state with no tick attached. They were looking for a scapegoat. I was looking very good for the role. Hollings said, The passwords and access codes must have been referenced in the metadata that went along with the original transfer. Someone bright had to have recognized it, copied it, and then used it to go back into the account while it was sitting there, in effect, open. I'm fucked, Watts said, growing red. Fucked! He began to slam his fist on his desk. They used my password! Fucked! Any chance it went through our software? I asked. Clarkson shook her head. Bypassed us. Are you saying this is the perfect crime? The sheriff demanded. There's no way to track it at all? No, I... Goldberg began. Wait a second. Hollings called out. The ten million. The first ten million. It's moving again. You couldn't tell up on the Google Earth map until the computer scientist gave her machine an order and new colored lines appeared. They all looked like they were heading back to the United States, to Southern California. But not quite. The lines converged south of the Mexican border. Banco Santander, Mexico, Goldberg said. Ensenada. Call that bank, I said. Find out who owns that account. Special Agent Townsend said, I know someone at the consulate here. Ten minutes later, she hung up her cell phone. She was grinning. The account holder is Edward Gonzalez, Mexican national, claims to live in Tijuana, but does virtually all of his banking online. They have records of his username, password, and IP address? Hollings demanded. They did, Townsend said, handing her a sheet of paper. The ladies from Cal Poly were joined by Mobot, all of them feeding the information through various tracking systems too esoteric for me to grasp. Five minutes later, however, Mobot threw up her fist and said, We've got them! They're in the City of Commerce! That computer is live and online from a light industrial complex east of South Atlantic Boulevard. The place is leased to a company doing business as L.A. Standard Demolition. Chapter 106 And suddenly, there was not much private could do. FBI, LAPD, and L.A. Sheriff's SWAT commanders took control of the situation. If Cobb and his men were as dangerous as Carpenter had described, it was going to take a whole lot of firepower to corral and subdue them. By eleven that morning, teams were secretly staging in the Hobart Rail Yard, a mile west of the address Mobot and the ladies from Cal Poly had given us, FBI snipers had already moved into the area around the building that housed the demolition company. They'd used infrared scopes on the exterior roll-up door and had seen evidence of two men inside. Were there others? Or had this been a three-man show that with the death of the drag queen skater was now reduced to two? Had they flown? Or were they just out somewhere? Special Agent Townsend, in consultation with her hostage rescue leader, decided to wait to see if more conspirators returned to the garage, a confined space where they could be surrounded and taken without civilian injury. It made sense. From the high ground, the FBI snipers had already taken up on the roofs. Cobb and his men would be sitting ducks if they tried to resist. It was a waiting game now. I yawned, realized I'd been up since 3.30. My stomach began to growl. I'd eaten nothing since the beer and popcorn the evening before. Well, 
if you didn't count five cups of coffee and the stale donut I'd salvaged from a plate in the mayor's office. In any case, I was ravenous. Townsend said there was food on the way, but that it would be at least another half hour. She added that I was good to take off in search of a quick meal. Unless something drastic happened, her teams were unlikely to assault the garage in the next couple of hours. She said she'd text me if the situation changed. I hesitated, but then nodded, got the Suburban, and drove toward the east entrance to the rail yard, listening to my phone messages. There were several from our overseas offices. Matty Engel had nailed the embezzler in Berlin, caught him red-handed on tape. Good news, I thought, as I cut across Telegraph Road onto Atlantic Boulevard and drove north. The light industrial area was to my immediate west now. A few blocks away, members of No Prisoners were being hunted, and there wasn't a thing I could do to help. The next phone message was from Peter Knight in London. He'd managed to extricate a very important client from the sex scandal sweeping through Parliament. Our client had nothing to do with it, only a tangential link at best, but she was young and a royal of some note. While the British tabloids are notoriously carnivorous when it comes to political sex scandals, even the whiff of a royal political sex scandal would have provoked a feeding frenzy that would likely have tainted her reputation for life. Well done, Peter, I said, leaving a message on his phone at work. Knight was also the man who'd stopped the maniac who'd stalked the Summer Olympics in London last year. I crossed Whittier Boulevard thinking that Knight deserved another pay raise, and so did Matty Engel. I also wondered if I might be able to convince Knight to transfer to our New York or Los Angeles offices. The widowed father of two was carrying on a long-distance relationship with Hunter Pierce, the American doctor and diver who'd so dramatically won the ten-meter platform gold medal at the— I passed the Robbie Eden Cafe, the first decent restaurant I'd seen since leaving the rail yard. I'd eaten there several times and fondly remembered the Bobby's Best Sandwich the hot pastrami and melted provolone cheese on toasted pumpernickel rye that came with a side order of perfectly crisp onion rings. My stomach growled loudly in approval of a repeat visit, and I parallel parked a block to the north of the strip mall that Bobby's called home. It was pushing noon by that point, and not surprisingly, the cafe's booths were jammed, but I spotted an open stool at the counter, and the hostess said by all means, I took a seat, my eyes burning and my ears buzzing from fatigue. A waitress named Alice came over, and I gave her my order, along with a request for a bottomless cup of coffee. She said it all would be right up and walked away. I yawned again, pulled out my phone, checked for text messages, found one from Justine alerting me to the fact that she had a doctor's appointment and would be unavailable between four and five that afternoon. At first I was annoyed. Why did I need to know? Wait, was Justine sick? Was that why she'd been acting so strange lately? A handful of horrible diagnoses tumbled through my brain, and the hunger gnawing in my stomach disappeared, replaced by a sickening feeling. What could she have? Thanks, Alice, a man said somewhere behind me and well to my left. His voice was hoarse and hinted at a Midwestern accent. You be in tomorrow, boys? the waitress asked. Nope, the man said. Got a job in Phoenix to take care of. For some reason, I glanced across the counter at the mirror on the wall facing me. Three men in green work clothes were paying up in the second farthest booth by the window. Two of them I could see only from behind, a burly Hispanic fellow and a taller Caucasian with wild red hair. The third man was quartering to my position, however, offering me a look at the right side of his face and chest, gaunt with iron gray hair. He was busy putting cash on the table and laughing at something the other men had said. I almost looked away, but then one of them, the Latino, began to hum that old Doors tune, Peace Frog. The guy sitting opposite him swung his attention away from the table, looking directly to his right, looking for the waitress, who'd gone into the kitchen. There was something wrong with the left side of his face, unnatural, as if he were wearing a skin prosthesis or heavy makeup or both. I stared into the mirror at the patch on the chest of the green jacket he was wearing. N-O-I-T-I-L-O-M-E-D. I flipped the letters in my mind. Demolition. Chapter 107
my heart began to slam in my chest. Cobb and two of his cold-blooded killers, whom I now recognized as Hernandez and Kelleher, were not twenty feet from me, eating at the restaurant closest to the garage, wearing urban camouflage, hiding in the wide, wide open. I looked away. For a moment I was unsure what to do. Robbie Edens was crowded, and they had to be armed. Any shooting in here could easily kill an innocent bystander, like the young mom and two kids sitting in the booth right behind the killers. I'd have to wait until they left, call Townsend to warn— The decision was made for me. Cobb began to slide from the booth. Hernandez beat him to it, getting to his feet, blocking my view of Cobb for a second, and then stepping left to allow Kelleher to exit. When he did, I could see Cobb clearly. He was staring in the mirror, locked on my reflection and then broke his attention away fast and in alarm. He'd recognized me somehow. It all went instinctual at that point, no choice of action but one. I went for the Glock in my shoulder holster, got it in one motion, spinning on the counter stool toward the no-prisoners conspirators, meaning to shout and threaten the killers onto the floor, fingers laced behind their heads. But Hernandez and Kelleher must have seen the warning in Cobb's eyes. They ducked and twisted toward me, hands clawing for weapons. My first shot caught Kelleher in the side of the neck, blew him back onto the table. My second shot glanced off Hernandez's rising gun, severed the tritium bead, and entered his skull through the right eye socket. Ignoring their bodies falling, ignoring the jerky movements of chaos rising all around me, the screams of panic and the muzzle blast ringing in my ears, I felt as if my gun sought Cobb of its own accord, as if I were nothing but a part of the weapon and not its controller at all. Cobb stood facing me next to the last booth in the restaurant before the hallway. A terrified young family cowered in the booth beside him. He grinned at me. A thin metal ring and post hung from his teeth. He held grenades. Two of them. Drop the gun, Mr. Morgan, he said, around the pin that locked the flip trigger on the explosive. Or many, many people will die. Chapter 108 at a glance, I could tell the grenades were not U.S. made, but Russian, old Soviet F-1s, the kind the Taliban used to lob at patrols in the high country north of Kandahar when they were really hard up for weapons. I knew this because fellow pilots liked to talk, and we'd hear from the patrols we were ferrying in and out of enemy terrain. The F-1 is distinctive, with a long stainless spoon and a pin safety system exactly like the one dangling from Cobb's teeth. The F-1 is also obsolete, no longer manufactured, even back then, which meant that Cobb's explosives were old, probably 30, maybe 40 years old. Another thing I'd learned about F-1s in Afghanistan, the older they got, the higher the chance of a malfunction. That was why the Taliban hated using them. They much preferred the M-10s we gave them back in the 80s, when the Taliban was called the Mujahideen. So I put the laser sight right in the middle of his forehead. Cobb spat out the pin, said, You shoot me. You take out Mommy here and the two kids and forty other people. So put it down, chopper boy. Not a chance, atrocity boy, I said. These little lemons throw shrapnel for two hundred meters, Cobb said, yanking the second pin with his teeth, spitting it out. Know how I know that? Because you've got the scars to prove it, I said. I do, Cobb said. So I'm not afraid to go this way. I've been here before. Cobb looked beyond me. He roared at the terrified patrons and waitstaff. Anyone makes a move for their cell phone and I will lob this right into your lap. He began to back up, and I realized there was an emergency exit in the hall behind him. I took a step for every one of his, moving past the dead bodies of his men, oblivious to the crying and terror all around me intent on keeping the red dot of the laser sight slightly above and between his eyes. How do you know who I am? Cobb asked as he moved fully into the hallway. They erased me. They erased all of us. A ghost named Carpenter told us who you were, what you did. He recognized that name, turned bitter. How'd you find us? I stepped into the hall after him, released one hand from the pistol and waved it behind me, telling the patrons to get the hell out of the restaurant. The whole time, I kept talking. One of your men got greedy, transferred the ten million we were tracking into his personal account in Mexico. We were able to track that account to a computer with an IPO address in the garage where you set up the phony demolition company. Cobb's face tightened. F*** 
Fucking Watson. Fucking greedy little... He's dead, I lied. Both your men at the garage are dead. Your two men here are dead. And Johnson's on ice in a morgue locker. You're the sole survivor, Captain Cobb. Cobb's back was to the emergency exit now. Behind me, I could hear people gathering courage and fleeing. Give it up, I said, wanting his undivided attention. You go out that door, you're dying like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. How's that? Cobb asked. FBI, LAPD, sheriff snipers are waiting for you to step outside. He hesitated and then grinned at me the way recon scouts used to aboard my helicopter as I landed them in a fire zone, smirking in the face of death. I think you're full of shit, Cobb said. There's no one out there. If there was, it wouldn't have been you they sent inside. He pressed his butt against the lever. The door clicked, opened two inches. Light poured in. Cobb shifted his head to look outside, opened the door farther. His face was silhouetted now. The laser sight trembled on his temple. Chapter 109 My finger tightened on the trigger as my mind whirled with thoughts, options, and dire consequences. If I shot Cobb just as he was going out the door and I was lucky, he'd pitch forward and drop the grenades. What was outside? An alley? A parking lot? I had no idea. In any case, it had to be better than the bombs going off in here. If I was really lucky, the door would shut behind Cobb before they blew. If I was unlucky, he'd crumple backward at the shot and drop the grenades, and I'd be shredded. If they went off. Cobb made the decision for me. He swiveled his head back at me and then made a quick jerking motion with his right hand, suggesting that he was going to throw the grenade at me. He sold the pump fake as well as any NFL quarterback. I couldn't help it. I cringed, shrank, just for a moment. But it was enough for the laser sight to slide off his head and for him to shoulder open the door and dart outside. I fired at the last of him. The round struck the steel door right behind his back. The door started to swing shut. Without thinking, I took four big leaps, heard a clanking noise, and kicked open the door. The second I saw the dumpster directly across the alley from me, I knew what Cobb had done, and I threw myself sideways and down. The grenade defied time and blew with extraordinary force. I felt it like a giant hand slapping me, boxing my ears, deafening me, and dazing me. But I wasn't cut. The grenade had landed in the near-empty dumpster. The heavy gauge steel walls had contained the explosion, forced the shrapnel upward like a deadly geyser. Knowing that what goes up must eventually come down, I threw my arms over my head and struggled to my feet. By the time I got oriented and turned, Cobb had exited the alley and was running diagonally across East 6th Street. He disappeared from view. I felt slightly off balance as I tried to sprint after him. Where was Cobb going? Anywhere but here? Or to a car? I got my answer when I reached the end of the alley and saw him running into a used car lot on the north side of 6th. I tried to aim but had no clear shot. I ran out into traffic. I still couldn't hear much, but then caught over the din in my ears the honking of horns and the screeching of tires as cars tried to avoid hitting me. Were those sirens? My eyes were scanning back and forth from Cobb to the area around him. I reached the sidewalk just as he vaulted a fence and landed in a second used car dealership. I crouched and scurried over to Atlantic, hearing shouts as I turned north, really hurrying now. Ahead of me half a block a cement mixer was parked, turning, while three laborers who'd been laying new sidewalk were looking toward the car lot. I popped up, saw Cobb pulling a guy from a silver Chrysler convertible with a yellow balloon attached to its antenna. He jumped in and the car started moving. At first I was sure Cobb was heading for the rear exit back into the alley, but he suddenly turned hard right, heading toward Atlantic. I ran, screaming at the guys working the cement. Get down! He's got a grenade! Either they saw my gun or they understood and dove into the wet cement. The others were slower to understand and were still standing there puzzled when I ran past, gun up, just as Cobb nosed the car across the existing sidewalk, looking to pull out onto Atlantic. I couldn't have been more than ten feet from him when I yelled, Cobb! He glanced at me, showed little surprise, and sidearmed the second grenade at me. 
Chapter 110 Time seemed to slow as the grenade bounced and rattled down the sidewalk toward me. Cobb stomped on the gas, shot out onto Atlantic, and sideswiped a commercial van. But I was focused on that bouncing grenade. An F-1 has roughly a four-second fuse. I caught it right-handed at two seconds, twisted, saw my target, and threw it at three seconds. Once upon a time, all I wanted to do was play football. For years, I'd throw footballs through a tire my father hung from a tree in our backyard, keeping at it for hours on end. Practice more than talent got me onto my college team. That day, practice saved my life. The grenade dropped into the cement hopper on top of the mixer, dropped into the huge barrel of the mixer itself, and blew with a muffled thud. Wet cement erupted from the hopper and discharge chute and rained down on me as I leaped out into the street. The van Cobb had sideswiped had crashed into a parked car on the other side of Atlantic. Cobb's convertible was picking up speed, heading back towards 6th. I went singular again, raised the pistol, and took one shot at his head. I missed and hit the back of the driver's seat. The convertible went out of control and crashed into a fire hydrant. When I got to the car, LAPD cruisers were coming at me from three directions. Cobb sat slumped against the driver's side door. His breathing was labored. He was coughing out a fine pink mist. I couldn't hear anything but the sirens now, but knew Cobb was probably making a gurgling sound, sign of a sucking chest wound, a sound that would have ordinarily sent me spinning back to Afghanistan, in country, where anything deadly was possible. But not that day. I was cold and utterly rooted in reality when I stepped up. Gun trained on Cobb's scarred face, as more frothy blood began to appear at his nostrils and lips, he gazed at me with utter bewilderment. Chopper pilot, he whispered. How did I... how did you... He couldn't finish, but I understood. He knew who I was. He knew some of my background. He considered me a stark inferior. Everyone gets lucky once in a while, I said, as the patrol cars skidded to a stop. Why did you do it, Cobb? His expression mutated into derision, as if I were an idiot not to understand why he and his men had killed twenty-one people, blown up the Huntington Beach Pier, extorted the city of Los Angeles, and looted a state revenue account for a hundred and fifty million. We needed the money, he rasped, laughed, hiccuped, and then shuddered when blood poured from his mouth in a torrent washing away the makeup and exposing that spider's web of scars. I heard someone shout, Drop your weapon! I did, still watching Cobb. He looked at me as he bled out. I can honestly say there was not a lick of self-pity in his eyes as they lost their light and went dead, dull, and gone. Chapter 111 Ellen Hayes ran her therapy practice out of an office on a side street near Century City. Justine parked, looked at the building, and then the sky, thanking God that Jack had survived his encounter with the No Prisoners conspirators. The news was all over the radio stations. Somehow he'd walked away relatively unscathed. That was what the newsreader had said, but a big part of her wondered if that was true, if it could be true. Mobot had called to fill her in on what they weren't reporting yet on the radio. The final two members of the No Prisoners conspiracy had been taken without shots fired, surrounded on all sides by snipers when they tried to flee after learning about the firefight at Robbie Eden's Cafe. Albert Watson and Denton Nickerson were in federal custody. So was Jack, while law enforcement sought to establish exactly what had happened inside the restaurant. Justine checked her watch, five minutes to four. For a moment, she tried to convince herself to call Ellen Hayes, to tell her about the shootout, and that she had needed to be with Jack for the moment. They could reschedule. But the old Justine pushed her out of the car. She couldn't be a friend to Jack or to anybody while she was walking around like this, feeling like this. Hayes was waiting for her. I've been worried since you called yesterday, the therapist said, leading Justine into her office. What's going on? Justine sat in a chair, sighed, and said, I have this friend, Jack. 
Hayes rolled her eyes as she took another chair. We're not doing the friend thing, are we? You said on the phone this was about you. This is about me, Justine said. But I wanted to tell you about this friend of mine, Jack. My boss, actually. I told him recently I couldn't understand him because he seems to grow calmer in chaotic situations, unfazed by violence unfolding right in front of him. Hayes frowned. Okay. Justine paused a beat, swallowing against the emotion rising in her throat. I found out something about myself recently, Ellen. In many ways, I'm Jack's opposite. I am unnerved in chaotic situations. I am terrified of violence, haunted by it in a way that... Hayes sat forward sympathetically. Tell me what's haunting you. It spilled out of Justine over the next forty minutes. Mexico, her anxiety, her casual liaison with a married man. You've described the attack, Hayes said when she'd finished, but not how it made you feel. Raw emotion welled up inside Justine. I don't know, she choked. I guess I saw how random and violent life becomes in an instant. It almost makes you afraid of the next moment. You know, if you let it, Hayes said, we are the sum of our thoughts. What you choose to dwell on will dictate your emotions. I know all this. Even experts need to hear it every once in a while, the therapist replied. Let's start by dwelling on the fact that you're alive. A good thing. Yes, but even that carries scars. Justine stopped, stared into her lap her shoulders quivering. Justine, this has changed me into someone I despise, Justine sobbed. I have to own what I've done. There's no excuse for what I did with Paul. Chapter 112 The therapist sat quietly for a moment, then nodded, said, You do have to own what you've done, Justine. You also have to own the fact that you went through an extremely traumatic experience, and because of that experience, acted on a romantic impulse when you didn't have all the facts. Isn't that right? He's married, Justine said. Yes, Ellen said. And he has to own that. He wasn't wearing a wedding ring. He asked you out for coffee. He didn't try to stop you in the gym. I was the aggressor. You're saying you were more powerful than Paul was, able to bend his free will so easily? Justine blew her nose, tried to smile. I am stronger than he is. I can do more pull-ups than he can anyway. But can you control his will? Justine thought about that, then shook her head. Good, the therapist said. Now, I don't want you to minimize what happened with Paul. But at the same time, I don't want you to minimize his free will in failing to tell you he was married and a father. Justine said nothing for a moment, but then sniffed and nodded. Okay, Hayes said. I think we've made more than a little progress. But our time's up. I have another client coming. Shall we schedule another appointment? But what am I going to do about... What you're going to do about Paul is a subject for our next session. It's enough for today for you to have gotten it off your chest. Justine wanted to argue, but sighed. You're the therapist. Outside, she could hear the din of rush hour traffic. It was five o'clock. She got to her car, feeling a little less confused, a little lighter, more... Her cell phone rang. She answered. Justine? Cynthia? Justine said, recognizing the voice of the Harlow's personal assistant. Can you come to the Warner lot? Maines asked, agitated. Right now? What's wrong? Justine demanded. It's worse, Maines choked. Much worse than you could ever imagine. Chapter 113 Cynthia Maines was waiting in a golf cart at the main gate of the Warner lot in the last light of Halloween. Justine hadn't remembered the date until she'd seen the kids dressed in costumes running from house to house. 
The Harlow's personal assistant looked shell-shocked. She'd obviously been crying. What's happened? Justine asked, climbing into the passenger seat. Maines drove on, her shoulders hunched forward as she said, I've learned that my life is not what I thought it was. I've learned that my beliefs are suspect, and that my instincts are worthless. She glanced over at Justine, looking lost. How is that possible? How is it possible to spend years of your life with people and not see them? Tell me, Justine said. Maines shook her head in disgust. It's something that has to be seen. They drove past the turn to the Harlow Quinn bungalow, past the sound stages, and parked not far from the cafeteria. They walked into a nondescript building with a central hallway. I got a friend of mine to let me use the screening room, Maine said, putting a key into a lock and opening a door for Justine. There were six theater seats inside and a good-sized screen. Justine had no idea what was going on when Maine's scooped up an iPad and gave it orders. Maine's hands were shaking. She seemed to be having trouble picking out the commands. I got worried after you left the other day, Maine said hoarsely, about the computers missing at the ranch and whether the files for Saigon Falls had actually been backed up. Okay, Justine said. I couldn't get into Harlow Quinn to take a look, Maine said. So I contacted the repository in Minneapolis where all the digital files were supposed to be sent. I had to talk to them a couple of times when we were setting this all up before the move to Vietnam, so they knew me. They had no idea I'd been fired and gave me a temporary password that allowed me to review the logs. Was Saigon Falls backed up? Maines's eyes were glistening with tears. That's what makes this all so awful. It was there, backed up around six the day Tom and Jen disappeared. It was a rough edit, but you can already see the genius of it. The storyline, the acting, the cinematography. I'd love to show it to you, but it seems so... Seems so what? Justine said, wondering where this was going. Maines looked lost again before saying, There was another backup made from the ranch the night they disappeared. Some sort of emergency thing. Maybe triggered by the power going off and the generator taking over? I don't know but about a hundred files were sent to the data bank that had never been there before. What were they? Maines replied. How is it possible that the artists who created Saigon Falls also created this? She hit return on the smart tablet, the huge LED screen lit, showing the Harlow's master bedroom at the ranch in Ojai. Chapter 114 A naked woman knelt on the bed, feet and butt facing the hidden cameras. She was whimpering in pain, as Tom Harlow crouched over her, naked too, sodomizing her while Jennifer shoved a dildo into her vagina and smacked her ass with her open palm. You came back early because you love this, Jen Harlow said in a taunting tone. Admit it, you little bitch whore. The woman just kept making soft, painful noises, like a rabbit Justine had once seen with a broken leg. Admit it, Tom roared. Turn it off, Justine said, feeling sickened. Wait, Maine said bitterly. It's important. Justine tuned out the increasingly lewd and degrading things Jennifer and Tom Harlow were saying to the woman, watched from her peripheral vision until Maine said, There. Tom Harlow had come off his knees rolled onto his right side, and pulled the woman down after him, so that the cameras caught the front of her body. Adelita Gomez winced with every one of Tom's thrusts, but she was not broken. She was looking defiantly at Jennifer, as if she would not allow herself to display any sign of humiliation or submission. Justine looked away toward Maines, who said in a numb, flat tone, I found other films like this with Adelita starring. When they were in Vietnam, they got her drunk. She cried like a baby the first time they took her. Turn it off, Justine said again, repulsed and filled with sympathy for the nanny. What was she, eighteen? Not yet, Maine said in a dull voice. It gets worse. I don't think I... There he is. 
said the Harlow's personal assistant, before her hand flew to her mouth. She whined. Oh, God, the poor little guy. In the lowest part of the screen, Miguel Harlow had wandered into the room. For a moment he was frozen, watching his adopted parents defile his nanny. Then he turned and ran out of the picture. His parents seemed not to notice him at all. This had to have been shot the night the Harlows disappeared, Justine said, watching Maines. Miguel didn't just hear strange noises. He saw this. He got scared. He ran. He tripped and fell, bruised his shins, and... Get off her or I fucking kill you! Up on the screen, four men dressed in black and wearing black balaclavas had burst into the Harlow's bedroom, shotguns and pistols trained on the trio. Tom Harlow stopped his frantic thrusting and squirmed away from Adelita, trying to cover himself, while Jennifer screamed, jumped off the bed, and reached for a robe. One man grabbed the actress's hair and hurled her against the wall. You going nowhere, you're going to need that, beach. He picked up the robe, looked away from Adelita, tossed it to her. What do you want? Tom Harlow demanded, now over his initial shock and trying to sound like one of the action heroes he'd played over the years. The men said nothing. But Adelita Gomez, in Jennifer's robe now, glared at Tom and spat bitterly at him. I want justice. Chapter 115 That's really what she said? Mobot asked, appreciation starting to show on her face. I want justice? Justine nodded, then shook her head when Sai offered her the bottle of Middleton Very Rare Irish Whiskey. Almost everyone from the L.A. office was in Del Rio's hospital room, called there by me to celebrate the fact that that afternoon, while I was battling no prisoners, Rick had shown movement in both knees and feeling as high as his hips. Sai offered me the bottle. I wanted it, but the nurse who'd examined me earlier in the evening said I'd probably suffered a mild concussion and should lay off the booze for a week or two. Meanwhile, Emilio Cruz was saying, So, someone, maybe that son of a bitch Captain Gomez sent those men to snatch the Harlows? Or maybe Adelita recruited the gunmen, I offered. I mean, she had to be the one who got them past the security. She had to have been the one who cast that shadow we saw behind Jennifer when she was returning from her jog the night they disappeared. How would she know how to disable security at the ranch? Del Rio asked. She'd never been there, right? Not to my knowledge, Justine agreed. But maybe she snooped around in their computers and found a diagram of it. Who knows? But I watched those guys in the Black Hoods shoot up the Harlows with hypodermic needles and carry them out of the bedroom. The camera seemed to be feeding directly to the data bank in Minneapolis until someone tore out the cameras and presumably took all the computers in the house. So you think they made a hundred of these films? Sai said, pouring himself a little whiskey. That's seriously twisted. Going back how long? Justine looked even more disgusted, said, Cynthia made me watch one more of them. It was worse, openly sadistic. She paused. I recognized the victim almost immediately. Who? I asked. Justine shook her head as if she couldn't believe it. I suspected something the other night at Sanders's, but I couldn't have known the deeper, terrible secret. What are you talking about, Justine? Mobot pressed. Who are we talking about? Del Rio asked. Anita Fontana, Justine said, the Harlow's housekeeper. No way, I said, flabbergasted. She's been with them, what, twelve years? Why would she stay? She could have left them, refused to come back when she went home on vacations. I think she had a reason she couldn't stay away, Justine said, her face a mix of compassion and ruefulness. What? Mobot asked. Miguel, Justine said. Last night when we were leaving Sanders' house, I happened to be at the perfect angle, watching her hold him in her lap, both of them in profile, the left side of his face, the side not affected by the cleft palate and all the operations he's had. You trying to say she's his mother? Mobot cried in confusion. I'm willing to bet on it, Justine said. I just can't bear to confront the poor woman with it. Not tonight. Wait a second, I said. 
Why would she give her baby to the Harlows? I'm guessing, Justine allowed. But it's not hard to imagine Anita wanting the best possible medical care for her baby, especially when he was born with such a dramatic abnormality, one that required so many operations. You could also imagine Anita, nanny to little Malia and baby Jin, sexual slave to the Harlows, being submissive to their rights and demands. Wait, Cruz said. What rights and demands? Paternal, Justine said coldly. I think Miguel is Tom Harlow's son. There was dead silence in the hospital room. I could see it. Tom Harlow fathers a deformed child while acting out his and Jennifer's perverse desires. The Harlows, with their pristine public image, don't want any of that coming out. It absolutely will not do. So they offer to adopt Miguel, making it seem to the world as if they're even more saintly than everybody thought. And Anita? She's allowed to work in the house, no longer nanny, no longer sexual slave, but forced to live a lie for the sake of her son. Amazing job, I told Justine, and meant it, and more. There's only one thing left for us to do now. What's that? Justine asked with some trepidation in her voice. Go back to Guadalajara. Chapter 116 Two nights later, around eleven in the evening on November 2nd, Mobot pulled a tan Ford van over and parked down the street from La Fuente, a five-star cantina on Pino Suarez, about a block from the Ministry of Justice in central Guadalajara. In the rear of the van, I checked the action of a Smith & Wesson 45. Pablo Cordova, the big Mexican in the long black duster sitting in the front seat, had provided the weapons as well as the van. Cordova was once a top investigator with the Mexican Federal Police. Now he runs our Mexico City office and is one of those guys who operate on the right side of the law. For the most part, when it suits his purposes. Cordova had met us at the Manzanillo Airport about five hours from Guadalajara, earlier on the second Day of the Dead, an annual celebration that involves everyone's ancestors and lots of tequila. The streets were filled with revelers wearing skeleton masks. Sigh, I said into a Bluetooth device in my ear. A blare from a mariachi band before Sai replied from inside the cantina. They're paying up now. How drunk are they? Justine asked. She was cradling a Remington pump-action combat shotgun with a halo sight. I saw them drink seven rounds with Cerveza Chasers, Sai said, but they probably had one more before I got in here because they're not looking too steady on their feet. Perfect, I said. In the front seat, Cordova nodded, said, I'm up, Jack. Seems time, I replied. Cordova tugged a skeleton mask down over his face, climbed from the van, shut the door, and started down the sidewalk toward the cantina, just as Commandant Raul Gomez of the Jalisco State Police stumbled from the bar, followed by his drinking companion, Chief Arturo Fox of the Guadalajara Police Department. This could get ugly and has big downsides, I said. Last chance to bail. Here we go, Justine said, tugging down her own skeleton mask. Mobot and I did the same, despite the fact that our plan could backfire and get us thrown into a Mexican prison for a significant stretch of our lives. Okay, Cruz, I said. They're heading toward independence. Mobot threw the van into gear, came parallel and then abreast of our targets and Pablo Cordova, who was quickly closing on them. Cruz, wearing a skeleton mask and a long black duster like Cordova's, appeared in front of the drunken cops. The right sleeve of the coat was empty, Cruz's right hand lifted, parting the coat, revealing a sawed-off double-barreled shotgun, which he aimed point-blank at the stomachs of Chief Fox and Commandant Gomez. We eased to a stop, blocking any bystander's view of what was happening. I slid back the door. Get in, Cruz ordered, or die. Chapter 117 for an instant I felt sure that the police officers were going to go for their weapons, but then Cordova prodded them from behind with his sawed-off shotgun and growled. You want to join your ancestors on the Day of the Dead, senores? 
Chief Fox broke first, turning and lurching into the van. You're making a big mistake, Commandant Gomez snarled as he followed his colleague unsteadily inside the van. On your stomachs, Justine said, making her voice hoarse and pointing her gun at them from the shadows. Crews climbed in after them, took their weapons, and emptied them of bullets as I slid the door shut. Cordova jumped into the front seat. Mobot started driving again. Nice easy pace, Cordova said. Cruz and I, meanwhile, threw zip-tie restraints around the men's wrists and ankles. They reeked of tequila and sweat, but showed surprisingly little fear when we sat them up. You'll spend many years behind bars for this, said Commandant Gomez in an angry, drunken tone. If you're lucky and I don't kill you first. Cruz gagged them. I blindfolded them. No one spoke during the drive. South of Guadalajara, near the town of El Zapote, Mobot turned off onto a two-track dirt road and bumped up it for several hundred yards, next to a condemned building that we'd scouted earlier in the day. Sai pulled up in a second panel van. Still wearing the skeleton masks, we got the two men from the van and took them inside what had once been a tool-and-die operation, using red-lensed flashlights to lead them through the debris that had been left behind. In a high-ceilinged space deep inside the structure, we sat the two men in chairs. Cordova said, We cut off the wristbands, but if you move, we will shoot you with your own gun, senores. Nod if you understand. Both men bobbed their heads. Cruz used a pocket knife to slit the ties. Sai set glasses of water in front of them as they undid their gags. The second the gags were off, Mobot threw a switch and high-intensity spotlights glared down on them. Chapter 118 What is this? Chief Fox demanded, holding up an arm to block the light glaring into his bleary red eyes. Who are you? What do you want? The state police commandant squinted into the light and demanded angrily, Do you have any idea who the fuck we are? See, si, Cruz said. We know who you are. No, Gomez insisted. Do you really know who we are? And what will happen to you if you don't release us? His brother-in-law is a very powerful man, Chief Fox said. Listen to him, my friends. You don't want to do this. We pay our dues. We are protected. By who? Cruz asked. De la Vega, Fox said, almost boasting. Antonio de la Vega. I felt a hand on my forearm, looked over at Cordova. We were behind the spotlights, still wearing our skeleton masks. He whispered in my ear. De la Vega drug cartel. One bad hombre. Reclusive. Doesn't like attention. Even better, I said leaned over, repeated to Justine what Cordova had just told me, and finished with, Have at them. Justine brought a chair with her. She sat opposite the men, pulled off her mask. Commandant Gomez recognized her, first incredulous, but then filled with drunken rancor. You will never leave Mexico alive. What is your relationship to Adelita Gomez, Commandant? she asked. The state police commandant's head retreated toward his shoulders several inches, like a turtle drawing into its shell or a snake about to strike. I don't know no one by that name. You don't know, Adelita? Justine said, looking at him with great skepticism. The Harlow's nanny from Guadalajara? No, Gomez said. Never heard of this girl. Fox shook his head. Guadalajara is a big place. I took that as my cue turned and made a cutting motion across my throat, and saw a red light blink back in the shadows. Cordova took the Commandant's pistol from Cruz and ran the mechanism as he stepped out into the light, still wearing the long duster and the skeleton mask. Get a better memory, senores, or I shoot you, he said in English. Not to kill, but to wound. They looked uncertain, but then Gomez started to say, I don't. Cordova aimed at the front of the Commandant's left boot and fired. Gomez screamed, tried to get up, and fell to the floor, writhing in pain, grabbing at his boot and screeching in Spanish. You're next, Chief, 
Cordova promised Fox above Gomez's agony. But I think I'll aim higher with you. What do you want? The sheen or the kneecap? The police chief had started to perspire. The sweat ran in rivulets down his face. Por favor, he began. Tell us something about Adelita, Justine said. Cordova ran the muzzle of the gun up the police chief's right shin, across his kneecap and thigh, aimed it at his groin. You would not do such a thing, Fox cried in horror. Try me, Cordova said. Fox looked down at Commandant Gomez, still writhing on the floor, his screams reduced to moans. Fox looked back to Justine. I'll tell you what I know. Cordova tucked the gun inside the duster. I threw a thumbs up into the darkness, seeing that red light blink again. Tell me about Adelita, Justine said. Adelita, Chief Fox said. She's Raul's niece. You son of a fucking pig, Gomez yelled at him. Where is she? Keep your mouth shut or you will die horribly, Arturo, Gomez grunted. What makes you think you're both not going to die horribly, Cordova said. Where is she? Commandant Gomez struggled up to his chair. Take me to a doctor. Maybe I tell you. Where is Adelita Gomez? Justine demanded again. Chief Fox glanced at the blood seeping from his friend's boot, said, Recovering, I think. From what? Justine asked. Plastic surgery. Commandant Gomez hissed, his face screwing up in rage. After what the Harlows did to her, our beautiful Adelita could not stand the sight of her own beautiful face anymore. Chapter 119 I've seen the films, Justine said softly. A terrible thing to happen to someone you love, Commandant. Where is your niece? I don't know, Gomez said sullenly. I think you do, Justine pressed. I think she is with your brother-in-law. Antonio de la Vega masterminded the abduction of the Harlows. He's the one who had Leona Casamadre killed. The state police commandant said nothing. Where are the Harlows? Some things are better not known. Where is your brother-in-law, then? Cordova demanded. I have not seen Antonio in ten years, Gomez said. This is the truth. But you can get word to him, Cordova said. I mean, he is your brother-in-law. Your wife and her sister must talk. I need to see a doctor, Gomez complained. I removed my mask and stepped into the light, saying, We'll take you to one, but then you are getting a message to your brother-in-law. We want the Harlows. We aren't leaving Mexico without them. Gomez snorted as if I were mad. You think you gringos can just come to Mexico and order a man like Antonio around? Actually, yes, we do, I said, and then nodded at the darkness beyond the spotlights. More lights came on, revealing Sai and Mobot in their masks, aiming video cameras at Gomez and Fox. Chapter 120 What is this? Chief Fox asked, bewildered. Shut up, you idiot! Commandant Gomez shouted, and then looked angrily at us. You can't use anything we just said. Of course we can, Justine said. The Harlow disappearance is the story of the century, or the decade, anyway. There will be all sorts of people interested in your confession. The footage has already been sent to a safe place in the USA, I said, which means you are going to go to your brother-in-law, and you are going to get us what we want. Gomez looked at us as if we were insane. My life does not matter to Antonio. Your life does not matter to Antonio. If he thinks I am to be exposed... He will kill me so I do not talk about him. Eventually, he will kill all of you. No, he won't, Justine said. If he kills you, if he kills any of us, the repercussions will be the same. People the world over will know of Antonio de la Vega's role in the Harlow abduction. So what does he care? Gomez said. See, si, Chief Fox said. Antonio is afraid of nothing. 
Bullshit, Antonio's a cockroach, Cordova said. And cockroaches don't like light. They need the darkness to thrive. The Harlows are like royalty, I explained. If their hundreds of millions of fans find out Antonio was behind the disappearance, the political pressure will become enormous. The law enforcement pressure will become enormous, beyond anything in your brother-in-law's wildest dreams. No amount of bribery will keep him safe. His cartel, his life, will be over. So will Adelita's. They'll both be torn limb from limb, Justine said. And you, along with them, Commandant. Gomez said nothing. Here's how it's going to work, I said. We will be at the Hilton, waiting. If we don't hear from you in 24 hours, the footage of your confession will be uploaded to YouTube and the feeding frenzy will begin for you, for your niece, but especially for Antonio. If you or Antonio or anybody tries to kill us, the same thing will happen. There won't be a dark hole anywhere in the world that any of you can retreat to. And if he complies? Chief Fox asked. His role remains a mystery, I said. And your role remains a mystery. We're only interested in bringing the Harlows to safety. The Commandant grumbled. What makes you think they're alive? If they're not, we want the bodies, I said. Chapter 121 Before grabbing Commandant Gomez and Chief Fox, we checked into a suite at the Hilton. Mobot and Sai rigged a fiber-optic camera at the suite door and linked it to a secure website that we monitored from sixteen blocks away in a shabby house surrounded by a high wall topped with glass shards. Cordova had rented the house from an old woman who asked no questions when he told her he'd pay five times the going rate if she left us alone. In shifts, we watched the website. For nearly twenty hours after we dropped Gomez and Chief Fox at a hospital, no one entered the Hilton suite except a maid around 11 a.m. on November 3rd. She looked around, realized no one had used the place, and left. You okay? Justine asked around eight that evening. I'd been staring obsessively at the screen while everyone ate burritos Cordova had brought in. I wish you and the others would take my offer. We're not going to leave you here to deal with De La Vega alone, Jack, she said. Just not happening. This was my idea, I reminded her. And I'm beginning to think it was a bad one, that De La Vega might go Scarface somehow, and that I may have put us all in his crosshairs unnecessarily. Justine laid her hand on my shoulder. We're all in this together, Jack. We're seeing this through together. But with every passing minute, I was becoming more and more on edge. Time gives an opponent a chance to come up with a counter-move. Had I given them too much time? Shit, Mobot said. Double shit, Sai said. I glanced away from the screen. Sai and Mobot looked like they were each about to birth a cow. Mobot was gesturing wildly at her computer, where bright orange numbers were blinking. Two, three, and four alerting us to the tripping of motion detectors we'd placed inside the wall that surrounded the house and yard. Someone had found us. Make that three, maybe four people had found us, and they had no interest in knocking. Chapter 122 The drapes were drawn, but Cordova flipped off the lights. Get low, spread out, Jack whispered. In the dim light shining from the computers, Justine saw Cruz, Cordova, and Sai fan in different directions. It seemed surreal to see Kloppenberg carrying one of the sawed-off shotguns. It felt even stranger to be holding the combat shotgun, her finger on the safety. Justine flashed on the image of Carla and had a moment of uncertainty until Jack eased up beside her, whispered, Some people will tell you that the best thing you can do when you're outgunned is to give up and negotiate for your safety. Nothing is further from the truth. If someone attacks you, fight, and keep fighting with whatever you've got, especially when you're dealing with people who have probably killed before. Like assassins sent by a drug lord? Exactly, Jack said, looked at Mobot. First shot, you upload that video. Mobot nodded, but Justine could tell she was shaking. 
For several minutes, there was just the sound of their breathing. Then, Justine heard a soft ding from Mobot's computer. Two new numbers were flashing, eight and nine, the rear bedroom and the bathroom windows. They'd already been breached, and no one had heard a sound. Chapter 123 I gestured to Cruz to cover the front door and to Justine to cover the windows in the main room. Then Cordova and I slipped off our shoes, turned on the red flashlights, held them beneath the barrels of our weapons, went back to back, moved sideways over rough wood floors into the hallway, guns and lights aimed in the direction of the doors to the bathroom and the rear bedroom. As we listened for any sound, any movement, any reason to open fire, I wondered whether this was it, after everything I'd been through, my family's disintegration and disgrace, the helicopter crash, my tortured relationship with my brother. Was I going to die in a squalid house in Guadalajara? Were Justine and the others going to follow me to the grave? We reached the end of the hallway and split. Cordova stood to the doorknob side of the bedroom door. I did the same with the bathroom door. It took everything in me to stay calm, control my breath and my heart so I could hear. A shuffle, right there on the other side of the door. Sometimes the best defense is surprise. Without thinking, I twisted the knob, hurled the door inward, felt it hit something soft and crunchy. I heard a grunt and jumped around into the doorway, trying to get square to shoot. But I came up short at a trembling sleek black pistol aimed by a street urchin who could not have been more than fourteen. He kept moving his right leg and cringing. Get back or I'll kill you, the kid snarled. No matter what my orders are, I'll kill you if you make one more move. Chapter 124 At ten past ten that evening, we drove past the wall that surrounded El Panteon de Belen Cemetery in Guadalajara. Park here, the boy said, rubbing at his knee where the door had hit him. He said his name was Roberto. He sat in the passenger's seat of one of the panel vans, his pistol in his lap, lazily aimed at my waist as I drove. We'd come to something of a Mexican standoff back there in the house and had negotiated a truce that allowed me to keep my weapon and my life in return for going with him and his two friends. Justine came along, too. The others had been forced to remain behind, which didn't sit well with Cordova or Cruz. But that was the deal if we wanted to find out what had happened to the Harlows. Where are we going? I asked. Inside, Roberto said. What's in there? I asked. What do you usually find in cemeteries? He said. Get out. Who sent you? Justine asked from the back, where two other armed teenage street urchins watched her. That's right. We're not getting out until you tell us who sent you, Roberto. I said, De La Vega, Gomez, Fox. I do not know these men, he said, opening his door. And I don't know who you are, and I don't care. This is a business transaction, understand? Chapter 125 Justine walked with Jack toward the entrance to the dark cemetery with the armed kids walking behind them. For reasons she wasn't quite sure she could identify. She felt none of the terror she'd endured during the attack inside the jail. Indeed, she felt strangely calm as they passed through an arched wrought iron gate, and she smelled the faint odors of incense and Jack. What do you usually find in cemeteries? Roberto clicked on a flashlight and aimed it ahead of them. There were gravestones, monuments, and tombs everywhere. Many were coated in red wax, which Justine guessed came from candles that had burned in the cemetery during the two days of the dead. The cemetery is haunted, the boy said. By who? Justine asked. Vampire, Roberto replied. He haunted the citizens of Guadalajara two hundred years ago. It started with small animals, dogs and cats, found all over the city, drained completely of their blood. Later, human babies were found dead and exsanguinated as well. Exsanguinated, Jack said. That's what I said, the boy replied. Where do you learn to speak English so well? Justine asked. 
Arizona, Roberto said. Lived there until my parents died two years ago. Then I came back here. Take a right there onto that path. Very smart kid, Justine thought. How did he come to this? Roberto, meanwhile, was going on with his story about the vampire. Everyone lived in fear. They stayed indoors after dark and prayed for their lives. A group of citizens who were tired of living in constant terror decided to end the daily nightmare and track down the vampire. They eventually found him, and when they did, they drove a wooden stake through his heart. I like it when that happens, Jack said. Reassuring. But this was not over, the boy replied. The morning after they kill the vampire, the townspeople bring his body here. They bring many rocks, too, and bury the body beneath them, hoping he will never return from the dead. You see this big tree here? Roberto asked, shining his light through a wrought iron fence that surrounded a massive live oak tree. They say the vampire is buried under this tree. They say that if the tree is ever cut down, he will rise from the dead and hunt again. Chapter 126 Okay, I admit it. Walking in front of an armed, hyper-smart 14-year-old kid through a graveyard haunted by vampires had me more than a little unnerved. I could see scores of ways this could turn out wrong, and more than half of them had me and Justine never going back to Los Angeles again. All right, then, Roberto said. Go left. I did as he said, walking past mausoleums, aware of the traffic noise and snatches of music coming over the cemetery wall. And something else. Was that crying? Then I lost the sound to a backfiring bus that accelerated away in the neighborhood adjacent to the cemetery. Are they here? Justine asked. The Harlows? Roberto and the other boys said nothing, and I looked all around at the dark outlines of the crypts, wondering again if the Harlows were dead. A sense of futility swept over me then. What had it all been for? Had we exposed the skeletons in the Harlow's closet, only to find where their corpses lay? Then, there they were. Before the flashlight went out, I caught a glimpse of fresh graves in front of me, three of them, two mounded over, one yawning. Stop, Roberto said. Do not move. Was this it? Would guns be pressed to the backs of our heads, and then a brilliant flash of light? and nothing more but a hole in the ground. They deserved it, a woman's voice said. They deserve to die. My head twisted about, eyes peering into the shadows in the cemetery, and then spotting her on top of a mausoleum about fifteen feet to our left. She wore a black dress and a hood of some kind. Adelita? Justine said. Adelita no longer exists, she replied bitterly. She has decided to enter a convent, become someone else, try to find some way to believe in God again. By becoming the Harlow's killer? Justine asked. Chapter 127 Justine felt sick to her stomach, waiting for Adelita Gomez to reply. She too had seen the graves before the light had gone out. After all the work, all the risk, the Harlows were dead, killed by the nanny they had defiled. No matter how she felt about the actors' many secret lives, she was shocked by the fact that they were gone. The Harlows were part of so many lives, including Justine's. She'd seen virtually every movie they'd ever made. And now, they were gone. Everything about this case suddenly felt cursed somehow. How would she tell the Harlows' children? What would become of them? Would they be manipulated and led by people like Dave Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves their whole lives? Justine felt overwhelmingly sad at the thought. Adelita coughed hoarsely. I said the Harlows deserved to die. I didn't say they got what they deserved. Wait, they're alive? Jack said. There's only one reason they aren't a meal for pigs, Adelita said. Cynthia Maines sent an email to my old box. She said copies of the tapes had gotten backed up somewhere in Minnesota. 
She said she would turn them over to the police if I wanted, or return them to me. And I realized that given what's happened here in Mexico, maybe living would become worse than dying for Jennifer and Tom. Where are they? Justine asked. Tell Cynthia I do not want the tapes made public, and I do not want them, Adelita said flatly. I will not come forward to testify against the Harlows in any way. And if you or the Harlows or anyone tries to come after me, my uncle will hunt Jennifer and Tom down like dogs. And then Justine heard it. The muffled sound of people crying, and she turned her head away from Adelita, trying to locate its source. Listen, Adelita said. They sound like me now. They're in the open grave, Jack said, moving toward the sound. Justine made to go after him, but glanced back at the top of the mausoleum. Adelita was gone. Justine whipped her head around, realizing that Roberto and the other boys were gone too. She'd never heard any of them move. In seconds, she and Jack were shining their maglights into the hole. The man and the woman sitting at the bottom of the grave were naked, filthy, and blindfolded, their wrists and hands tied together with rope. Even through the grime, Justine saw the festering sores on their skin where they'd been burned repeatedly with what would turn out to be a small, round branding iron. The woman had four such weeping burns on her face, which was so swollen that for a moment Justine did not recognize her as the most glamorous and famous actress in the world. Jennifer Harlow cringed from the light, whimpered, and clung to her husband, whose face looked worse than his wife's. Mr. and Mrs. Harlow, Justine said, trying to calm down. You're safe now. My name is Justine Smith. We're with private investigations worldwide, Jack said, jumping down into the hole, taking off his jacket, and putting it over Jennifer before he set about removing their blindfolds and untying their bonds. We've come to take you home. The actors both collapsed into sobbing. Justine dialed Cordova's number on her cell phone, asked him to order their pilot to fly private's jet from Manzanillo to Guadalajara, and to hire a discreet doctor willing to fly with them to Los Angeles. She also told Mobot to alert Cynthia Maines, David Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves. Do people know we're gone? Jennifer asked weakly when they'd gotten the Harlows out of the grave. The fans? It's been international news, Mrs. Harlow, Jack said. Jennifer stared off into space at the wonder of that. Tom said, What will people think of us now when they see what's been done to us? I honestly don't know, Mr. Harlow, Justine replied. I'm afraid that's something you and your wife will have to discover for yourselves. Epilogue The show must go on. Chapter 128 Late on the afternoon of November 15th, Justine and I sat in a dive bar not far from the Warner lot in Burbank, sipping beer and watching Bobby Newton gush some total fabrication crafted by Camilla Bronson about the Harlow's daring escape from the clutches of their biggest fan, an insane, obsessed man who'd held them in a doomsday prepper's bunker in the Sonoran Desert somewhere south of Tucson. There you have it, the most up-to-date scoop on the entire sordid affair, she said. Though we've yet to see Jennifer and Tom appear in public, the FBI and Mexican authorities assure us that they are hunting for the as-yet unnamed madman. Until my next status update, this is your best friend forever saying follow me on Twitter, hashtag BFF Bobby Newton. I'll be tweeting all updates in the Harlow case as they unfold round the clock. No mention of private at all, Justine said, finishing her beer. Just the way we like it, I said, getting off the stool and laying down a generous tip. L.A.'s finest ninjas. What do you think they want to talk to us about? I'd imagine they'll have an entire agenda, I said. We drove Justine's car to the Warner Gate, where Cynthia Maines was waiting for us. We'd spoken several times since our return from Mexico, but this was the first time we'd seen her in person. Have you spoken with them? 
Justine asked. Not a peep, the actor's former assistant said. I just got a summons from Dave Sanders, just like you. We walked to the Harlow Quinn bungalow, where we found Camilla Bronson waiting for us out front. Thank you for coming. Wouldn't have missed this for the world, I said. The publicist went stony, barely gave a nod to Cynthia Maines, turned and walked inside. She led the way into Terry Graves's office. Dave Sanders stood by the window. Jennifer and Tom Harlow sat at a conference table. Their faces were still heavily bandaged from the emergency plastic surgery that had taken place immediately upon their arrival in Los Angeles. But their famous eyes inspected us one by one. Hello, Cynthia. Jennifer began in a mumbling voice. Her former personal assistant shot back. If it wasn't for Adelita's wishes, I'd be turning over those tapes right now. Don't even think about that, Sanders growled. Those tapes were and are private property, recordings of activities among legal consenting adults. Consenting? Cynthia cried. Terry Grave shut the door, said, Shall we all calm down here, discuss our differences, figure out a way to win-win? I really wanted to punch the producer right then, but kept my cool, said, What did you have in mind, Terry? Chapter 129 The head of Harlow Quinn Productions went into full-on schmooze mode. Jack, Justine, Terry Graves said, exuding the deepest sincerity. Jennifer and Tom would be saying these things themselves, but they've been advised by their surgeons to speak as little as possible. Justine glanced over at the actors, whose eyes locked with hers a second. She saw every shade of pain in them and fear, but it did not change her opinion of the Harlows, not one bit. Terry Graves went on, saying, We, all of us at Harlow Quinn, Jen and Tom, are eternally grateful to you two, and to Private, for the courageous act that saved the Harlows and brought them home to us and to their children. Justine had to bite her tongue. For the first four hours after their rescue, Long into the flight back to Los Angeles, neither Tom nor Jennifer Harlow had mentioned their children. Granted, they'd been doped up on painkillers, but not once. Dave Sanders picked up the pitch from the producer. We're all grateful for your discretion, as well, in keeping your promise of client privilege regarding what really happened in Mexico. And why, Camilla Bronson said, glancing nervously at Tom and Jennifer who'd taken to inspecting the wood grain on the table. Yes, well, Terry Graves said and coughed. But the important thing is that the Harlows are home, and soon they'll finish their masterpiece. And they, we, wanted to thank you. Graves reached over and handed Jack an envelope. Jack took it, opened it, looked inside, then showed it to Justine. A check for five million dollars. We trust that's enough for you to ensure bonuses for all the good people at Private who were involved in the rescue, Sanders said. Sure would be, Jack agreed. But Private's not in the business of taking money from starving orphans to save degenerates from a just reward. Chapter 130 a silence so complete took the room that I swore I could hear the pounding heartbeats of Jennifer and Tom Harlow. What's that supposed to mean? Camilla Bronson said in an uncharacteristically high-pitched voice. It means that this is not going to be the typical Hollywood scandal complete with requisite cover-up, I said. For once, this is going to unwind with justice being served. Sanders' face turned almost purple. You and Private have a legal obligation to— No, Dave, we don't, I said calmly. That obligation went south the day you fired, Private. What we did in Mexico, we did on our own. So, we'll be the ones who decide just compensation and penalty. You— you'll get nothing if you expose them, Camilla Bronson sputtered. Everything will be ruined, Terry Graves said. Their careers, their children, the orphans, countless others. We see that, Justine replied. 
and we know justice isn't always just, I said. A garbled voice said, What's that supposed to mean? It was the first thing Tom Harlow had said since we'd arrived. It means, Mr. Harlow, that we're not going to tell the police or the FBI about your secret lives and transgressions, Justine said. There was a collective sigh. But in return, we have specific demands, I said. These are non-negotiable terms. And these terms are? Jennifer Harlow said. Cynthia Maines said, Number one, the Harlows will never seek to retaliate against Adelita Gomez in any way. Deal, Tom Harlow said. Number two, the Harlows and Harlow Quinn Productions will sign over 60% of all gross proceeds from Saigon Falls to sharing hands, I said. 60% of the gross, Sanders cried. Are you mad? Jennifer Harlow made a wheezing sound. Her husband started to shake his head, but then Justine said, Perfectly sane. In return for our not revealing the extent of your fraudulent use of non-profit funds for personal and corporate gain, you are going to increase that orphan's endowment tenfold. But the Harlows put their life savings into the film, Terry Graves protested. Tell that to someone who gives a shit, Terry, I said. That's term two. Accept it or suffer the consequences. Chapter 131 No one said a thing for a moment, until Camilla Bronson chimed in. It could be to your benefit, Jen, Tom. We announced the profit-sharing deal a month before Saigon Falls debuts, and the public will think you're saints. First Jennifer and then Tom Harlow nodded. Smart move, I said. Term three. Financial control of sharing hands, including the endowment fund, will be turned over to an independent and impartial trustee who will manage it the way it is supposed to be managed. In this case, that trustee will be Cynthia Maines. All eyes turned to the Harlow's former personal assistant, who said, I feel like I have a lot to make up for. Sanders looked ready to argue, but said, We agree. Anything else? Yes, one last term, Justine said before staring at Tom Harlow. The Harlows will sponsor Anita Fontana, Maria Toro, and Asinta Feliz for U.S. citizenship. The Harlows will also pay Miss Fontana a sum of three million... What? Sanders thundered. Three million dollars, Justine insisted and guarantee that Miss Fontana will be given unrestricted access to her son, Miguel, and to Malia and Jin. The cook and the maid will receive a million apiece. This last exchange caught the Harlow Quinn team completely off guard. Wait a second, Camilla Bronson said. Miguel Zanita's deal, Jennifer Harlow said. Excellent doing business with you. I said, standing up and pocketing the check Terry Graves had given me. Once Miss Maines assures me that all the money you siphoned from the Orphans Fund has been repaid in full, I'll cash this, use it to fund pro bono work. Chapter 132 That went better than expected, Justine said when we'd gotten back to her car and were heading to the office. It did, didn't it? I said feeling like we'd actually righted wrongs. Karma will still find them, you know, Justine said. The Harlows? What goes around comes around. Let's hope they avoid it for a little while longer, I replied, then glanced over at her. You look happy. Do I? Justine said. Well, I suppose I am. For a while there, I thought you were sick or something. I caught a hesitation before Justine said, Maybe I was. I'm getting over it. She didn't say another word, and I figured that was the way she wanted it. I looked out the window the rest of the drive back, past Disney and Universal, and up over Barham Boulevard to Mulholland Drive and down into Hollywood, thinking that there was no real truth in L.A., only the clever stories people choose to tell themselves and to believe. Want to go somewhere? Get another drink? 
I asked Justine when we pulled up in front of Private's offices. Doctor's appointment, Justine said. I peered at her. You okay? Getting close, she replied. You ever want to talk? I know, she said. I got out, watched Justine drive away, and suddenly felt exhausted and in need of a vacation. Jack Morgan? Yes, I said, turning to see a stocky, bald guy walking toward me, hand reaching inside his jacket. My mind screamed, gun. Carmine's hired someone else to. Consider yourself served and subpoenaed, the bald guy said, slapping a sheaf of court papers against my chest. I took them, opened them as he walked away, found that the subpoena had been filed by Shank, Rossi, and Petard, one of the premier criminal defense firms in the country, in the case of California v. Thomas Morgan, Jr. Chapter 133 Tommy was wasting no time in bringing me into an airing of his dirty stories. The trial date was at least four months away, but he and his high-dollar lawyers, courtesy no doubt of one Carmine Nochia, were letting me know in no uncertain terms that they planned to put me on the stand. I almost went inside, but it was all so depressing that I just started walking. I didn't want to think about my brother or Carmine or whoever might have hired the hitman who'd tried to kill me at Justine's. I didn't want to rethink the Harlows and how we'd played them. I didn't even want to think about Del Rio and the fact that he'd be leaving for a more aggressive rehab unit in the morning. I just wanted to walk until I had a clear mind, and then maybe go look for a little fun, a little peace, a little time away from me. I set off down Sunset Boulevard, a man without a car, a freakish thing in L.A., moving with no particular place to go, hoping for serendipity to... My phone rang. I stopped, closed my eyes, and prayed it wasn't someone like Sherman Wilkerson, my client who discovered the first bodies in the No Prisoners case, telling me about some emergency I had to attend to, clean up. But it was a number I didn't recognize. I answered. Jack Morgan. I was thinking again that we've had enough dress rehearsals, Jack, crooned Gwynscott Evans. I smiled. Were you really? I was, she said. I am. Where are you? My place, she said. I got home yesterday. You have plans tonight? That's why I called. I was hoping you might have a plan, Jack. My smile broadened. I crammed the subpoena into one of my pockets, feeling serendipity swirling my way, and said, Meet me at my place in an hour. I'll be showered, changed, and ready. I'll take you out for a first-class meal, an excellent bottle of wine, and, well, a grand opening night, she teased. I was thinking Masterpiece Theater. Oh, I want front-row seats for that performance. Chapter 134 Justine drove north on the Pacific Coast Highway. The sun had set. She'd just left her fifth session with her therapist, Ellen Hayes, since returning from Mexico. Things were better, not perfect, but better. She'd gotten perspective on what had happened to her in the jail cell in Guadalajara and on the Harlows, especially now that she and Jack had put the screws to them. But Justine remained unsure of how and where to talk to Paul and what she should say to him. She hadn't gone to CrossFit once since coming back for fear of running into him. Her therapist had recommended the direct approach in a quiet, neutral venue, like a Starbucks. Was that the way to go? I need a man's perspective, Justine thought, and it became clear to her that she had to go to Jack's, and then she realized that subconsciously she'd already been on her way there. I'll tell him, she decided. Everything. I'll ask his advice. A few minutes later, Justine almost pulled into his driveway, but saw two cars she didn't recognize. That wasn't unusual. One of Jack's few vices, besides Middleton very rare Irish whiskey, was a love of high-performance cars. He bought and traded them all the time. Justine parked up the street, thought about calling ahead, 
but figured Jack wouldn't be upset if she just knocked on his door. He said any time I wanted to talk, didn't he? Jack's house was set slightly down the bank. A high hedge helped block it from the highway bustle. Justine was almost to the end of that hedge, almost to his driveway, when she heard a door open, footsteps, and a woman laughing. Jack joined her, saying, I swear to God. The woman said, I like you, Jack Morgan. You are a funny guy. Justine knew that voice, that accent, didn't she? Australian? And I don't think I know a smarter, funnier, or more beautiful woman, Jack replied. Unable to help herself now, Justine peered through the hedge and saw Gwen Scott Evans climbing into the passenger side of a black Mercedes sports car. She looked absolutely stunning. Justine's stomach fell a long, long way, and she was suddenly hyper-aware that she was horribly alone in life. Jack was dating Gwen Scott Evans? When had that started? The memory of what Justine had once had with Jack seemed almost suffocating right then. Not sexy, Gwen said, and shut the door of the Mercedes. Oh, you've got that sexy thing in spades and aces, Jack said, climbing into the driver's side, shutting the door, and starting the engine. For a second there, as Jack was getting into that Mercedes, Justine saw him clearly in the light. He looked genuinely happy, the kind of happy you didn't see often. It was that rare a thing. Justine spun around and hurried away up the sidewalk as the Mercedes backed out and drove off, heading south. She stood by her car, watched them leave. Jack's taillights blurred into every other taillight in Los Angeles and disappeared. For a long moment, Justine just stood there, staring off at the point where she'd lost them, telling herself it was good that Jack had someone new and exciting in his life, even though it made her realize she had feelings for Jack that she just couldn't ignore. She couldn't stop herself from hoping that maybe one day they would make it work. You've done a lot of things tougher than this, little sister. Wiping away a few tears, Justine already felt stronger, as if she'd shouldered the weight and was ready to do the heavy lifting in her life again. Private L.A. Written by James Patterson and Mark Sullivan. Read by Jay Snyder. Text copyright 2014 by James Patterson.